What's up, BTW fan? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Unlacing K Fabe. It's your pro wrestling media host. It's me, Nikki T. Hanging out, Mr. CJ Morris here. And today, guys, we got a great episode for you. We got someone who's the foundation of building the wrestling organization. The backbone, you know, these guys are unsung heroes. These guys don't get the limelight, they don't get the time in the spotlight. But guys like this are trained some of your favorite superstars you would never even know. This guy's put in, put in you know, nearly 30 to 40, you know, you know, over 30 years, four to five decades of working under the, behind the scenes without getting the credit, without getting the recognition. So today we'd like to give him time to speak his mind, give him the spotlight, and let him let you guys know why he's still in the business and what motivates him and what he plans to do going forward with the business. Guys, we're going to get on the phone none other than Rudy Gonzalez, the owner of Texas Wrestling Academy. Can you hear us? How you doing, boss man? Good morning. Good morning to you guys. Hey, this is CJ. How you doing, CJ? Not too bad. And this is Nick. Hey, how you doing, Nick? Pretty good. It's been good talking to you, man. I'm glad we finally got you on the phone here. <laughs> it sounds a lot better with words, my friend, over on the phone. <laughs> so first off, let's get that. We're in uh, Melbourne, Florida. It's like Central Florida. Right, right. I just, I was just there this weekend, man. It's like, uh, like I, we were going down to uh, where were we going to Winter Haven? Yeah. Okay. And and we were going down I seventy five. Yep. Which is on Facebook. And man, like here in Texas, the, the they up the speed limit to seventy five, and in some places eighty miles an hour. Yeah, you guys got those off ramps you can go on too. Yeah, so I was doing 75, and their cars passed me, like, like <laughs> standing still. And I'm like, what the hell? So I look, and uh, I, I tried keeping up with one of the cars. He was doing, like, 90, 95 miles an hour. That's Florida, like, brother. And, yeah, they, uh, don't, they don't really follow you. They don't really the, follow you, too. They, they can't leave. They said it's more of a they can't really follow you. not a speed yeah, limit. Yeah, they, they really can't follow you past a certain speed limit. It's past a certain speed, so they kind of just look the other way. <laughs> Yeah, so, so well, yeah, because I was following this guy, and I, he was doing 90, at the, well, yeah, I was doing 95, and he was in front of me, and we passed a trooper uh, on the side of the road, and yeah. I thought, shit, I'll get pulled over. Nope. And he just sat there. He just, nope. He didn't do a thing. Nope. They don't even look up. <laughs> they got other things to worry about. You know what, man? It's too hot to be all doing all that, that driving, man. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely, you know, being in Florida, you know, you get used to that kind of thing. You know, the police here are, they're kind of, they're kind of back and forth about it. Like sometimes, depending on what town you're in, they'll bust you by right. speeding. But no, that's, that's in town. Don't be good speeding in school zones, stuff like that. But if you're on a highway, they kind of just look the other way. I noticed that. I noticed that. I didn't see anybody get pulled over on, on 75. And on the way back, we were in, we ended up in Miami. So yeah. On the way back, we're coming up 95. I didn't see anybody get pulled over. Especially not, no especially not down south. Side, no. Nothing. Especially not the further south you go, they, they don't give a damn. <laughs> Once you get down, like, past West Palm Beach and stuff like that, for, you know, Fort Lauderdale, they, they, have, they have so many other things to worry about. They're like, just don't kill each other. You'll be all right. What were you in, uh, what were you in Winter Haven for? What are what? What were you in uh, Winter Haven for? Oh, so my girlfriend, Micah, uh, she wrestles, and so she went and did a show for Thunder Championship Wrestling at uh, at this place called Tanner's Lakeside or something like that. Nice. And they had a packed house, man. They had like 400, 500 people there, and it was nice. pretty cool. So that was like Friday night, and uh, we had nothing to do Saturday, so we drove to South Beach Saturday. Hey, there you go. Yeah, and hung around and stuff, and we tried to drive by the, where the, where the uh, condominiums were. Fell. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And you can't get close. I Blocked mean, off, right? Block, but, I mean, and I wasn't gonna get out and park in somebody's front yard and walk over, you know. So we just drove by, and um, you know, cops everywhere, and and uh, you could see the pile of rubble and stuff, and it was pretty. It's still sitting you know, there. It, yeah, it's pretty devastating when you look when you think about the buildings that are around it, and then at one at one time a few weeks ago, this, this, there was a building in this very spot where this pile of you know, it's now gone. Now. It's crazy, right? And you know, with those buildings, they and don't it, check them. They don't check them for stability and structure. Those condos right. have been there for like 40, 50 years, and they've never been checked again. So that's I'm surprised. 
that's what somebody was saying that they, they were pretty old buildings and stuff. And then the thing that their actually body is still laying, you know, just sitting there, buried, sitting underneath, you know, yeah. right? Yeah. And the slowest, yeah, the know. slowest response time ever for you know emergency services. Right. It's been you know three or four weeks. I'm like, you guys should have this cleaned up all the way by now. There's no excuse. This is one building. You know, you're right. like, and you guys not can't. You know, obviously, you don't want to you know speculate, but it's like it's an unfortunate situation. But you know, the families of these people don't heck don't care. They want they want they want to find the loved ones and you know whatever's paid their final yeah. respects or whatever. You know, imagine right. imagine missing your grandma. You exactly. Know, and saying exactly. stuff like that. Anyway, let's like, let's bring it back to a happier note. <laughs> we don't make everybody sad here. Yeah, like years ago, we went to Ring of Honor. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. During during nine you know nine eleven happened wow, and yeah. we drove we drove through New York and I mean that was that was unreal. I can imagine. Yeah. How, I, how long after uh, was it? I see nine eleven well, probably two three months after it happened. There was still a pile of rubble ten stories high. Oh yeah. Right, and then like uh, I don't know maybe we went by there again and it was just like an empty hole. Oh, yeah. Duh, you know, and it was like a crater in the earth, man. Else, well, at least they put a good memorial over top of that bad boy. That memorial was pretty dope. I can only imagine, like, you drive by there going right. to a show and, like, look at that building that used to be there. It's not there anymore. <laughs> you know, it's so unfortunate. And I seen on your trip you were struggling to find some good food. Right. I was yeah, going yeah. to tell you, hit you up, over man. near us, there's a bunch of good Mexican food. Down in, down in Miami, though, there is only Cuban food. There's only Cuban food, brother. <laughs> Maybe some Peruvian if you get lucky. <laughs> I, noticed, I noticed that there are a lot of places that's... Just, what was that? One, but we, we ended up going to IHOP. <laughs> no! <laughs> hey, man, you can't get wrong with pancakes. Hey, you can't go wrong. You can't get wrong with pancakes, brother. Right. All right, well... You jump into this a uh, little bit on your backstory. Where were uh, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and, and this is my home. So day one, born and raised, and then you're still there now. Oh, I, was, I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, baby. How about them Spurs? I. <laughs> I'm not a Spurs fan, but <laughs> yeah, they they've enjoyed some success, and now they're stumbling with um, you know the players just aren't there that they had before. No, so they're they're having a hard time. It's this it's year. cyclical, man. You you have success for 20 years, like Pop had, and you know, kind of eventually the shoes falls off the other foot. And you, but I you know I trust Pop; he'll he'll, he'll bring it back around. You know that that, that yeah, franchise I mean, came from nothing. Pop, Pop's a good coach. I was trying, you know, you know, I was you know whenever I'm around Spurs fans, I'm always like. Well, he must not be that great of a coach because, I mean, it's easy to coach David Robinson and, and Tim Timmy Duncan, and right? Parker, yeah. You know, now, now you got these lower level type guys. Let's see how well you can coach now. And, and, that, um, that's that's, that's why, you know, th- th- that's to me, that's the big thing. Like, are you really a good man manager like Phil Jackson? You manage talent? Or are you a technical coach who can bring up guys that aren't the greatest talent in the world, but you can make it work? X's and O's. So exactly, we'll, we'll see. Exactly. We'll see. We'll see what Pop Sex and those look like. Is he going to be able to develop these young kids and make them into talents, or is it going to be a thing like one well, you draft them another number one old draft off, draft pick and build from there? So we'll see. Right. I'm, exactly. I'm a big sports guy, so I you know I appreciate Pop what Pop's done for the NBA, and you know I, I appreciate his uh, his ability to be a wise ass. So I'm a wise ass myself. So I I appreciate the way he handles the media. You know, he, he gives them little little snippets, and he, you know, he gives he gives it back to them, which I appreciate. You know, they ask him the same stupid question. He doesn't he doesn't entertain fools. So I appreciate that about Pop. Um, and speaking of sports, I mean, did you play? And it's funny because like some of the some of the some of the media guys ask the most ask the nine questions. It's so sick. Like, how can you not? How can you not come back with a smart ass answer? Like after a loss, after a playoff game, they ask him, "How do you feel about this loss?" And he's like, "Well." It's like, uh, lost. it's like, how am I supposed to feel? You're <laughs> wrong, you know? What what can you do to uh, be better? Well, we can be we can be better, you know. Right. And that's why I love the way he handles it, and the way Bill Belichick handles it. You know, if you're gonna ask me the same stupid question, I have, I'm gonna give you a stupid answer back. I'm just gonna stare at you exactly. blankly. I love the blank stare where it just he just stares. At them. It's my favorite thing. 
Uh, are you, any, you so you're not a Spurs fan, but did, and, you know back in the day, did you play any sports? I played football. I played uh, I played football from fifth grade to uh, I played one year of junior college, okay. and then uh, I played baseball. I suck. I'll, I'll be the first to say I sucked at it. Me too. Uh, <laughs> See, I was good at baseball. I sucked at football. And I, and I, they stuck me out in center field, and uh, so I just sat out in center field and yeah. my nose. Work. Picking daisies, brother. <laughs> Trains, my friend. I like it. Man, it's my own heart. Yeah, baseball. Yeah, baseball yeah. was never my thing. Like, I, I can never throw it right. And I, I tell you, like, one of the physics by hitting a ball that's coming at you 80 miles an hour just doesn't work for me, brother. I, I'm, I'm See, good on that. Baseball, I was good. Football, mediocre. <laughs> and when it came to like high school wrestling, I was always the the fat kid. So they put me in with kids that were three times bigger <laughs> yeah. than me. So from day one, I was getting my ass kicked. <laughs> I never wrestled, oh, like, I did basketball and baseball, football, for sure. Baseball. Was that brother? Seriously. It was, I was so bad at baseball oh. that I would hear the umpire say, you know, strike, and I'm swinging. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, I was on one second delay. That's me. Yeah, yeah baseball, I could never. And that, you know, that's why I appreciate that guy, those guys. You know, they, right. the pitcher's throwing 100 miles an hour on a, on a, on a dime. And a catcher tells him to put it somewhere, and he puts it there. I'm like, how on earth could you possibly do that? Or a slider, or a curveball. And how does the guy hit it? I just, it, anyway, that's why I infinitely respect those guys. I, it's boring, it's not my cup of tea, but, but to, to, to know the physics behind that game is just absurd. Right. My hand, my hand-eye coordination sucked. So, <laughs> uh, I played I played one year of baseball and that was it. They called me out again the next year and they're like, "Hey, Rudy, you were really good last year." And I'm like, "I'm thinking to myself, well, no, I wasn't. Stop lying." No, I guess the people, on the, you guys just need bodies out here. <laughs> what position did you play in football? I was running back and I was uh, I played linebacker. Okay, that a boy. That a boy. That a boy. Now playing, uh, I played a little bit of quarterback, but I wasn't. I I couldn't throw very far, so. Uh, if they put me at quarterback, or if they put me at quarterback, it was to run the. He ball. was running. He was running QB sneaks yeah. all day long. <laughs> he was Mike Vick before Mike Vick. <laughs> now playing sports stuff as a kid, were you a wrestling fan at that time? Nope, oh, wasn't a wrestling. That, this is that. Here's the irony of this whole. I love this part. Of my whole wrestling career was when I grew up, I was not a wrestling fan. I, my dad took me to two wrestling shows when I was younger, when I was like nine or ten, and I, it just didn't appeal to me. I didn't. Uh, I remember on the card with like Wahoo McDaniel and a guy named Thunderbolt Patterson and yeah, okay. I mean, names today that I'm like, holy shit, you know, I mean, big names, but back then, didn't mean squat to me, didn't, didn't mean anything to me, I, didn't, I could care less, and so, I guess my dad saw that I wasn't interested, and so we never went to another wrestling show again. He said, I'm uh, not wasting my money, right? <laughs> and, and then, and then when I got older, I came home from college, and my high school football coach knew, knew Joe Blanchard. Okay. And here in, San, here in San Antonio, back in the 80s, the sports community was pretty tight. Everybody knew everybody. The, the basketball coaches in the high school knew all the football coaches, and they all knew the college coaches, and everybody was, the sporting community was pretty tight. So uh, Joe Blanchard, uh, my football coach, George Paschenchek, referred me to go train at the Southwest Championship Wrestling Wrestling Academy because I had no place to train at during the off season. I came home from college and I'm gonna be here for a couple of weeks and so my coach said, Well go train at these you know, this this guy started wrestling school. He goes, and, he, and and my coach told me, I'm not telling you to be a pro wrestler. I'm just saying go train with these guys. I'll talk to him and he'll he'll let you train with he'll let you train there for free. And, okay. uh, I like and, some of that. 
Joe so Black it was, was just kind of get in shape athlete. and stay in shape on the off season to begin with. What was that? I said it was just kind of for you to stay in shape during the off season. Yes, yes exactly. I mean, we did a, a ton of cardio. We did yeah. squats. We did box jumps. I mean, we did. I mean, it was, everything was everything was cardio. I mean, wrestling is cardio based. And uh, so yeah, I mean, and, and and they didn't charge anything. But then when it was time to go back to school. Uh, I did go help with the ring at a show, and I got hooked. I'm not, I don't know how. I don't know. <laughs> the bug got you. The bug got you, man. <laughs> what main, was it at the show the main, that got main, you hooked? The main event was Tully Blanchard and Wahoo McDaniel, and, wow. and I got hooked. I mean, wow. Uh, Once he yeah. started throwing in chops, you got <laughs> you got That's hooked. That's what it was, man. That's what it was. It was like those. I mean, from where I was sitting at, I was doing security at one of the back doors. And so from where I was sitting at, was at least 40 yards, man. And, and Wahoo chopped Tully a couple times, and I, did, I sounded, I mean, they sounded like it was right next to me. Wahoo chopped Tully. <laughs> that's what they that's, say. He's the king of the That's chop. skin, man. That's skin on skin action, brother. Yeah, and the fans were going nuts. And and I don't know, man. I, I got, I, well, let me put it this way. I never went back to school. I, that was it. I got the yeah. rest. The bug got you. So then, uh, did uh, the Blanchards? There, they trained you afterwards. So, so yeah. So it wasn't really actual formal training. Like there wasn't. So they did have the school. And so the guy that ran his name was Larry Lane, and he did mostly a lot of shoot wrestling, a lot of amateur wrestling. Okay. So sorry, yeah. And uh, so. Now I start, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get to the folder and thing, and so I was mainly helping out in the office, uh, counting t-shirts and stuff like that, and uh, helping with the ring, and, and then they got me to referee, and then every now and then, like, Manny Fernandez would say, hey, you want to go in the ring and roll around, or, or Al Perez, or Ali Bay the Turk, or somebody would go out, and we just, you know, we'd wrestle, we'd, you know, uh, do amateur type wrestling, and then somebody would say, hey, uh, you got to take a hip toss? And of course, I, you know, nope. Okay, well, let me show you. And so <laughs> guys like like Manny and Grenade Boyer and and Bobby Duncan, they show me like little things here and there. The guy named Billy Valentino showed me an arm drag, and and uh, so this went on for for uh, a couple of years. This I, I actually started in '82, and then in '84, a guy no show. It was short somebody. And Al Perez uh, suggested to the booker, uh, Jonathan Boyd, hey, Rudy's out. Uh, Monday Night TV, my job was to ring the bell. So Al Perez suggested to, to Jonathan Boyd, <clears throat> Rudy's out there. He knows how to bump. And so Jonathan Boyd said, we'll bring him back here. So Al Perez called me to the back, and there you go. I borrowed Eric Embry's wrestling boots. Nice. I borrowed... <laughs> Bobby Fulton's wrestling trunk <laughs> at, at, at 7.45 I'm standing outside the ring getting ready to ring the bell and at 8.15 I'm in the middle of the dressing room wearing some boots that were a little bit too big and some <laughs> trunks that were a little bit too tight and, and uh, that was it man my first match was being a guy named Manny Villalobos against uh, the Sheep Herders Thank oh, wait a minute that's uh, Butch they became the what the uh, Bushwhackers Bushwhackers right yeah. The Bushwhackers, well, yeah. Later on, they became the Bushwhackers. The early they changed their style, though. They were way more, a little more rough in the ring back when you wrestled them, right? A little bit more aggressive, yeah. Yeah, and, I remember that. Yeah, they were a little bit more aggressive. But um, I would trade that match for the world, man. That was that was like a baptism in fire. You How know? cool is that, man? <laughs> you got wrong size boots on, wrong size tights on. You're in there with some savages from, the, from down under, brother. That sounds like a hell of a first match to me. That's sweet. Yeah, I mean, they... They, uh, you know, kind of breaking, breaking the table a little bit. They took care of me. They, they, um, they, you know, they gave me a little bit of stuff here and there. Right. And then they came, then we came to the back, and Luke Williams said, you're not bad, mate. You know, you just need to get your own gear. And, uh, <laughs> right. somebody gave me, somebody gave me a number to the guy that makes boots. Somebody gave me the number to the company that makes wrestling trunks. And there I was. I, you know, now I had to save some money up to buy that stuff. Right. And, uh. And so there, there, there it was. I, you know, I got my stuff. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I got whatever money I had and sent it to the, a guy named Bill Ash in Arkansas. 
and I don't even think I sent him my measurements on my, like now you, you, you measure your calf and your leg and all sorts of stuff. I think I just told him I wore a size 10 and a half boots. And yeah, yeah. He, he sent them, you know, sent me a pair of white patent leather boots, they fit like a charm. Wow. And then the, the people in the made the trunks, it was called a, it was a place called k and Wrestling in Ohio, I believe. And uh, I just told him, hey, I, I like a pair of, you know, black wrestling trunks. The funny thing back then was, though, I called these places, and they would ask, you know, who are you and stuff, where do you wrestle at? And then they would say, well, let me call you back. And so they would call the local promotion. I was going to say, they check up ask, on you, to make sure it's legit. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. They would ask, Joe, you know, hey, is this guy wrestling for you? And if they said no, you weren't getting, they nope. weren't going to make shit for you. you. You were out of luck. You had to, you know, so not only was it, was it hard to get in the business to even be trained, it was hard to get a pair of boots. Exactly. <laughs> boots and tights, oh, man. Yeah, now, now you just go online and there's guys making trunks and there's guys making outfits and there's guys making boots and there's guys making everyone is a boot maker everyone makes it there everybody makes it's crazy it's, it was you know, it definitely was a different time you guys had it a lot harder they they were a little stiff on you guys in the beginning before they even smartened you up about the business right I wasn't okay so uh, I, so uh, they had me doing t-shirts and stuff like that and whatever and then um, I think what happened was one of the ring guys got caught with weed. I think, I'm not uh -oh. sure exactly what happened, but he ended that up was less. So, and Joe Blanchard was pretty strict on that stuff. He didn't, right, yeah. you know, he knew guys smoked and did whatever. But the ring crew guys, I mean, you're in charge of the ring, you're driving the truck, you're, you have a lot of responsibility. responsibility. Yep. You, you could not mess around. Your first one there, the last one to leave. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I, I think what I heard was one of the guys got caught with weed or something, so he got fired. So now they're short of referees. So then uh, they put me in to referee matches. I did like the first two matches. And and uh, here's the other funny part was no one ever told me to finish it. No one ever told me, uh, hey, Mike's going over or Joe's going to run in. or I just did the first two matches, which... Back then, the the uh, mentality was the first two matches, you just go out there and wrestle, get the crowd going, and that's it. Right. And so that's all the guys did was they just they just you know no one ever went outside the ring. Uh, there were no chairs or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. you, just went out there, you just went out there and wrestled, warmed up the crowd, and, and that was it. And so um, I wasn't smart. They, no one no one told me anything when I walked in the dressing room. Part of my, one of my jobs was. Uh, getting the guy's stuff from the ring and taking it to the back. And so when I grabbed, you know, uh, you know, so-and-so's cowboy hat or so-and-so's robe or jacket or vest or whatever, I take it to the dressing room. All of a sudden, I would hear the guy, you know, K-Babe, 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 you know. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm like, what the, f you know, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, that, I, know, I, know, yeah. I had no idea what, what they were talking about. <laughs> So I was I wasn't even smart, and when I when I would go in the dressing room, if guys were talking like a good guy and a bad guy, they separate right away. They, you know, I was that's just how the wrestling was back then. Oh yeah, they, it, they, was, they, it was that secret brotherhood. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Different locker rooms, I was in, but I wasn't in. And so, uh, like during the match, so I started refereeing matches, and I could hear the guys, you know, all right, I'm gonna throw you in the ropes, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna kick you. And match. I'm like, what? I'm thinking, I'm like, what, 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 what was that? And then they <laughs> back on me, so I can't hear them. This and was as you were uh, refereeing? This is hilarious, man. <laughs> yeah, and it, I think like one guy, Ron, uh, Rex White, or Ron White, or something, what his name was, he was like, mind your business, referee, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> just like, shut up and count the fall, asshole. Shut up and count. <laughs> what talking about, you know? And then, and then finally, there was a match, uh, I did the first two matches, and uh, so usually I got out of my stuff, went and sat in the back of the building and watched the matches and stuff. And so I was changing, and Luke Williams said, don't get out of your wrestling, don't get out of your referee stuff yet. Yep. And I was like, all right. So Going then, back uh, in. <laughs> uh, I forgot who it might have been, like Chavo Guerrero and Gino Hernandez or something, but wow. uh, huh. yeah. they call me to the mm -hmm. They call me to the side, and they're like, okay, uh, Gino's going to do this, and then Tully's going to run in there, and then they're going to hit the referee, and then Manny Fernandez is going to run in there, and then you got to go in there. And I'm thinking, how do they know this is going to happen? How do they know that? And so when I'm watching the match, and sure 
up, everything that was explained to me was happening. And I'm saying to myself, how do they, how do they know that? The puzzle the pieces around, start to fall together. I'm watching the match and I hear someone go, 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 God damn, go, go, go. And I'm okay. like, oh shit. So I had to run out there and do whatever I did. And, but the rest of that night, it was like, it just blew my mind. Like, how did they know? And yes, everybody, I, I, I was completely ignorant to pro wrestling when I broke in to the, <laughs> to the business. That's how it's I, supposed to be. I had no idea. And that's just how you were. That, that, that's how it was back then. Yep. That's how, that's how it was supposed to be. It's kept that way for a yeah. reason. You had to earn the strike before, yep, they, before you, they gave you your own. You know, see, you know, brotherhood, like, you weren't a part of it. You don't know that you don't know the deal, and you're not supposed to know the deal. And that's mm-hmm. what kept, you know, that's what kept that line up and kept, you know, the tension and the drama and the real excitement about it because you really, you really, really didn't know. And that's what. That's what. That's what drew tickets. I that, mean, that's, that's yeah. what, and when was. that when that finally ended, do you think that was the downfall to where everything started to change <laughs> once fans could get online and. You know, that, and that, look up that, some the whole storyline. Yes, that, I mean, yeah, I got the business is. Uh, I mean, there's bigger crowds and stuff like that now, whatever. Right. But um, I don't know if this makes any sense. But there's more guys who were making money back then than there are now. Now there's one oh, big yeah. company, two big companies, make three big companies, but and and guys are you know are doing well. But back then there were territories. And guys were, and I know this because I saw this. I saw guys like, uh, like uh, uh, Joe LaDuke, you know, get paid twelve hundred dollars cash. Yeah. For what? For what show? That's crazy. And I saw guys like Manny Fernandez get paid eight hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars, nine hundred dollars, six hundred dollars. You know, now guys are happy with a hot dog and a hand. You know, <laughs> <laughs> hot dog and a hot dog and a handshake. And guys are like, I'm making it. You know, no, you're not. You're no, not making right. shit. You're not. You're and, not. You're and, never gonna get there. I feel bad because these guys they think that they're on top of the world and they're not. The guys that are on top and they're not on the independents. The guys on the independents are on top. I, I they're at the position I was when I was at the bottom. And, Isn't that crazy? And I can say I can honestly say that my apartment, my cars, my groceries, my cable bills, all my all my 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 expenses were paid. Through wrestling, right. I didn't have to have a, uh, a second job two or three, three other jobs. Yeah. 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 You're a weekend wrestler. They're weekend I'm wrestlers. In I'll, fact, I'll say this: when I got started, I wasn't making jack. Yeah, and sure. So yeah, I had to get a landscaping job. I had to a uh, tree trimmer. I had to stuff stupid stuff like that. But until I started like getting into swinging things and refereeing, and then I was the ring crew. I was the head of the ring crew guy, which was the referee guy, and that started wrestling, and that started making some. I started this start making some money, then I didn't have to rely on, you know, cutting someone's grass and then and then going home and changing real quick so I can make the town. I was I was my bills were getting paid through wrestling. And and uh, not many guys can say that today. I mean unfortunately guys are working part time at Walmart or something and then they gotta get a day off so they can make, you know, to travel for a show. Again. You know, they're weekend they're weekend warriors now instead of being actual athlete, uh, actual athletes and being wrestlers. Yeah, and, and that and that was it. Also, was I re- I worked uh, seven days a week, Monday through Monday was TV, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and sometimes on Sunday we wrestled twice. Yeah, but yes. I was I was working seven days a week, and and uh, now guys are wrestling Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Friday and Saturday, or. Complaining, Friday, Saturday, complaining yeah. about it, like they're on a loop or something that's crazy. <laughs> Try to be on the road 240 days a year, brother. Like, that's a, that's a real, a real right. schedule. A while back, I tried booking a show on a Wednesday, and I tried getting some guys to work that show, and they're like, well, I got to work, man. I'm not going to be able to get out of work in time. And it was like, you know, God, I had the same problem, too, when I broke in, but at some point, I said, you know what? I'm going to do the rest of them. It takes and dedication. Screw the, land- screw the landscape and stuff, and I did. I made a choice. And and I guess I guess you know certain people took notice, and then I started getting booked more more often, more regularly. And then again, that's when I started making and making a living at doing the wrestling stuff. That's right. You know, it's the time. The fact that you put that grind in, and you know, you know, it's gonna be hard in the beginning. How many times have we seen stories? Steve Austin getting fired. You know, these guys started out from the bottom, but they kept going and they didn't quit. 
and then you know now they became people who are actually making money. But if your whole your whole thing is to just go wrestle two days you know two days out of the month, what do you expect? No one's yeah, gonna, you got no gonna pay you. No dedication to it. Nobody's. You're not nobody's taking your crap seriously, you know. You 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 gotta you know in, in anything it could be wrestling it could be being a dentist it could be being a plumber it could be a cop it could be anything you gotta put in there's gonna be some kind of sacrifice you gotta make. And you gotta be all in or, you, or you're not in at all. Exactly. And and I heard a, a perfect perfect example is uh, is years I tell this story to my students because I mean I deal with the wrestling school business end of it and. I see the same stories over and over again, but uh, when I was running Shaw School, I had two guys that were starving. I mean, they were making peanut butter tacos. Uh, I mean, they were eating peanut yeah. butter and tortillas and canned of tuna fish because that was cheap stuff to buy at the store. I mean, they were starving. Yeah. And uh, I took them to go eat. I saw that. I liked the kids. They worked hard. I said, hey, man, let's go. Know, let's go grab some to eat. I'll pick you guys up. And like we have no money, coach. I'm like I'll, I'll, I'll take care of you guys. Don't worry about it. And I just want to sit with them and talk and just hang out with them for a little while. And and uh, so when I went to go pick them up, man, they, you know, you know, I, I was waiting in their apartment with no furniture. They just had a TV and some <laughs> video, some VHS tapes. Some hey, macho man style. Yeah. <laughs> um, and their kitchen, their refrigerator had a half jar full of peanut butter, you know, and and. Uh, a bunch of empty tuna cans yeah. the kitchen smelled like shit and, <laughs> and uh, so 20 years later I go to I go to Los Angeles I meet up with one of them and he's in he's living in Malibu in a nice little house nice. and uh, we go to eat and and you know we go to this little fancy schmancy restaurant and so I pull out my debit card I'm like hey I got it and he's like I got it coach don't worry and, you know still call me coach oh, I got it coach and he pulled out his Black America Express card, <laughs> oh, that's a, yep. which, which I've never, I didn't Time even know. Change. I was like, "What card is that?" He's like, "American Express." Only certain people have. Yeah, you got to qualify program. for the MX, the black card. <laughs> certain and spending limit. Now he's a producer for WWE. He goes by D. Brian Kendrick. Oh, oh, yeah, spoke spanking. He's, he's doing un unbelievably great, but and Brian Kendrick was the same yeah. way. I was the other kid. He was the same way. They were starving years ago and and uh, I mean now I, I, I looked on Wikipedia or Google and I don't know if, I don't know if that shit is real or not but I think Brian Danielson was worth like two million dollars oh yeah probably, probably more than that 19, I just I mean, seen him at Wrestlemania yeah, this year that kid I mean he had a, a, a little uh, sports car and that was all he had to his name and I think his parents owned it I mean he was <laughs> those kids were starving but they they struggled and they sacrificed, and I mean, and look where they're at now. It's a prime example that uh, growth takes a little bit of being uncomfortable. Yeah. A little bit of pain. A little bit Struggle, of pain, you, you know. Get it, you stick through it. Well, it teaches you to appreciate, you know, when you do get to go get your place in Malibu, you, remember, you don't forget where you came you from. You appreciate it a little you bit keep, more. You keep grinding after, you know, you're never done grinding, you know, and if you see anybody successful, the grind never stops, it, you know. They, you know, The Rock right now, The Rock's still filming 15 movies at a time. He doesn't have, he can stop doing it right now. He can retire right now and never film another movie. But he's not going to. You know, The Rock was another one, man. He, yeah. went, when he broke in, I mean, he tells a story. He, he had $7 to his name and yeah. he couldn't get, a, he couldn't get yeah. signed on to a Canadian football team. And he right. was, like, struggling. And, I mean, it's, the wrestling business, the guys that are on top are full of guys full of that, 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 that sacrifice. And, uh, and went through a lot of shit, yeah. but they maintained, and they just kept going, they kept the grind, they kept the grind, they kept the grind. And uh, Macho Man told me years ago, as long as you're in the game, you're in the game. Yes. Yeah. Which means, oh yeah, uh, as long as you're doing this, there's a, there's a chance, there's still a chance that something may happen, something is gonna be there, something may, you know, I, I'm a good example, I, I was in the business for, uh, at that time, 15 years, and I was just an indie guy. I was just, I was just an independent wrestling guy. I, I, I did some jobs. Yes, I was a, a jobber for WWE. I did some stuff for WCW. I went to Mexico for a little while, and I mean, I got screwed on paydays. And and, and uh, this is one thing when, when the territories were alive, I was doing well. Then when the independence started hitting, then things kind of got 
start to get a little screwy. And um, but I had to like you know hustle. I had to you know travel around to make the money and stuff. And there was a point where I was like, you know what? Finally, I said, you know what? F this. I'm done. I'm done wrestling. I'm gonna start doing something else. And that's when Sean called mm-hmm. and, and and asked me to run a school. And that changed. That changed everything for me. You know. And to this day, I'm great. I tell him that every time I see him, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because I mean, I was I was already at the point where I was done. It all happens for a reason, then, right? Yeah, exactly. So I tell my guys, I tell my students, man, as long as you're, as long as you're willing to, you know, and it's a hard, it's a hard road, man. But you know, as long as you're willing to struggle, as long as you're willing to work hard, as long as you're willing to, you know, do the things that you may think right now is stupid, but it's not. It's just part of the deal. Um, if you if you watch the Broken Skull sessions, like I watched that stuff religiously. Yeah. Uh, all those guys Steve Austin has had on his show, from Chris Jericho to Kevin Nash to, uh, I mean, the list goes on. They all have basically the same story. Yeah. Absolutely. And look where they're at. Yep. You know. So I had a question for you. So when, when Sean um, called you about the school, what was his pitch to you? What was what? Well, so I said when Sean called you about you know the, the wrestling school, what was his pitch to you? What was his his uh, selling line, what did he tell you he's, he's going to have you doing? I want, I want you to help coach my school. I want you to help coach my students. And come from Sean Michael, that's enough. <laughs> had he worked, he had worked with you previously? Actually, 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 actually once, once uh, it was a process because I didn't think Sean was actually calling me. My phone rings and I answer it and I'm like, hello, he goes, this Rudy comes out and yes it is. He goes, hey, this is Sean. And I was Sean, who's this Sean Michaels? And I was like, what the? <laughs> Who is this guy? Because <laughs> I thought he was ripping me. No I way! Like, I come on. I thought he was pulling a rib on me. Right. So he called again, and he's like, "Rudy, I'm going." Yes. He goes, "This is Sean." I go, "Sean, who?" He says, "Sean Michaels." Man, quick! And I hung up. You know what? Talk twice. That's two times. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, imagine a wrestling, imagine a wrestling guy. You know, answer the phone and say, uh, hey, kid, this is Mr. Ben. Ah, I know that. Oh, you hang around, right, well, you hang around right away. <laughs> you don't believe yeah. that's Mr. Ben. He's going to offer you a deal. And so finally Sean said, you know, you know, I, he called again, and uh, he said, don't hang up. I said, well, who is this? He goes, Sean. I said, this is a Sean. So we went back and forth for a while, and I said, what do you want? He said, I'm going to have back surgery in a couple months, and uh, while I'm out, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be resting up, but I'd like to start wrestling school, and I'd like to be one of my coaches. And uh, I was like, uh, okay. When, <laughs> Easy you know, to say. This, this is November. This is November, October of '98, and okay. he said, oh, wow. I'm looking at April of, of next year. And so I had. And so the, 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 the back the back story of that is, I had just did a show. Uh, here in Texas, I got screwed on the payday, and I walked out, gave the promoter, the booker, my money. I said, "F you, I'm done with this shit." And I walked out, and that that Monday, I went, and got a job, uh, twelve bucks an hour, which in, which in 1998 is, was good money. Not too bad, not twelve too bad bucks an hour here. working at a warehouse, and uh, so you know, then that same that that was like Monday, I got that job. Wednesday when Sean called. And so he says, well, I'm not looking to start until April of next year. So I said, all right, well, yeah, let me know, you know, whatever. And so between then and when he started, I was making 12 bucks an hour. Uh, and the only thing was I was doing a warehouse job, and I was working 12 hours on, 12 hours off, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And I hated it. I hated that. Especially I hated coming that from job. wrestling. It. Jeez, but it's a big change. good money. I was making, you know, thirteen, forty hundred dollars a week. You know, I was making good money, and because uh, you're putting in overtime stuff also. And but I hated it. And so when Sean called in, in April, he called in March actually. And he said, "Hey, uh, we're gonna have a meeting, and like you to attend, and, and what have you." And I said, "All right." So uh, when we talked, I I asked, him, I said, "Hey, uh, I never asked you about this, but what do we get paid?" <laughs> <laughs> kind of <laughs> crucial aspect there, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> in the course of all this, we had bought me and my kid's mom. We had bought a house out by SeaWorld, and it wasn't a, it wasn't cheap either. It was a it was a, a, a you know, it cost nice money. Nice house. Yeah. So um, he said, uh, "Well, so we're getting started. Uh, I'm looking at paying you guys two fifty a week." And 
so I'll pay myself two fifty a week, and I'm doing thirteen hundred dollars a week at the other place. Yeah. Which it, it should take a rocket science to figure that scientists to figure this one out. But I was like, uh, uh, <laughs> I was like, all right, and he said, all right, and so then we started training, and I quit my the other place. I gave my two weeks, and I quit. Um, my kid's mom didn't realize I quit. I was about to ask you how I was about to ask you how that went down. <laughs> yeah, oh man, it went <laughs> like a like lead balloon, man. <laughs> it went down, man. It was it was. Uh, the ship was sinking. But after after like a week or so, she said, "Are you on vacation or something?" Because I was yeah. Home and stuff. And uh, actually, it was too because I was able to like leave the house and hang around places. I would say he's floating away. He's he's trying not to be home. <laughs> Start coming like he's <laughs> That's awesome. And then, like, and then after a while, man, that gets boring and it gets old and stuff. And you right. know, so I just started hanging around the house. And so she asked me, she goes, "Are you on vacation?" I said, uh, "And I do. Here it comes." I said, uh, oh, "Nope." No. She said, uh, uh, "You've been home. Uh, you're not going to work." Or I'm like, uh, "We need to talk." <laughs> she's, like, she's like, "All right." So we sat down at the kitchen table, you know, and. Uh, I said, remember I told you back in November, Shawn Michaels called me about his wrestling school and stuff. And she's like, yeah, how, you know, is he opening it after all? Or how was he doing with that? And I'm like, yeah, we've been doing, we've been training for like two weeks now. We. Oh. <laughs> and she's like, I forgot to oh, tell you. You've been training with him? I said, yeah. And she said, what time y'all, what time y'all training? And I said, uh, from seven to, to 10. Oh, no, 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 I said from set from 9, from 9 in the morning, is what we're doing, 9 to 12, I said from 9 to 12, and she said, um, so, where have you been the rest of the day, I said, <laughs> well, six hour gap there, man, <laughs> I'm like, um, yep. so, I quit working at the warehouse, and she said, what, I said, um, I quit working at the warehouse, she goes, so you're working with Sean now? I said, yeah. She goes, okay, what's paying you? I said, yeah, now I'm thinking to myself, fuck, here it comes. <laughs> oh, man. Um, it's going to be 250 a week. Oh. And she's like, wait a minute. Are you stupid? <laughs> so my like, fourth of the pay? <laughs> I'm like, um. No. But she goes, are you insane? Are you out of your mind? That may be. And then she just like, let me have it for like, it felt like, Eternity, but yeah. was probably maybe a couple of minutes. You stupid mother, we got a house, and blah, blah, blah. what about the kids? We're gonna feed these kids. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, uh, I just sat there, let her, because I it was it was a, it was, a, it, was it, it was a hard decision to make, right? Uh, not really, but <laughs> not for you, but uh, <laughs> for her. <what>? After, <laughs> after she finished, I'm like, I saved some money. I saved some. She goes, how much have you saved? How much? Is, how much have you ever been saved? And I'm like, I have like eight grand in the bank. <laughs> you know, eight grand in the bank. And she's, she's like, like oh. that's supposed to that's supposed to make that's supposed to last for. What are you crazy? Blah, 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 blah. And it went off oh. again. And so then um, finally, I just after she finished again, I said, hey, I, I hated that job. I couldn't stand it. I was making ten times, twenty times more money than I would, ever was with wrestling. I just could not stand it. I right. could not stand it. I hated it. And I said, at the gym, I'm with a bunch of guys, they're all learning, they're all, you know, wide-eyed and bushy-tail, and, you know, everybody works hard, and uh, I said, I know I'm not making as much money, but I'll make it work somehow. I said, well, I'll still, my, my, my responsibilities are still the same, and uh, so, I mean, she, she saw that, I mean, there, there was nothing she was going to say or do to, no. I, I think even she figured, even if she said, I'm leaving, they wasn't going to work. Um, so I guess you figured, you know, all right, let me give this dumbass, <laughs> <laughs> let me give this dumbass enough ropes so we can hang himself. Right. And so she, she said, all right, you know, uh, you do what you think is right. And so that was it. Um, the funny part was that after a few weeks, so they, uh, so the trainers were me, Jose Lothario, and this guy, Ken Johnson, who was Jose's buddy. And he had, Ken Johnson is actually the guy that trained Shaw, not Jose. Okay. Jose, oh, wow. Jose did the thing where he sat outside the ring and told Ken, do this, do that, do this, do that. Oh. So, uh, Jose and Ken had a fallout. I mean, uh, Jose and Sean had a fallout. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so Kent, Jose was gone within a month. Wow. And so, yeah. And so then uh, me and Kent took over. And so Sean boosted our pay a little bit. And then Ken, and then Sean brought in a guy named Paul Diamond to help. I don't and mind. Paul was a mess. Uh, I, I have nothing but respect for him. I understand the situation. But there were some issues. And, uh, and me and Paul bumped heads. I mean, you know, it wasn't peaches and cream. Uh, but again, I, I, I've been in the business for many years. And I understood where he was coming from and, and what he was dealing with. So it, there was, there's no anger, hate there. It's just like, damn, man, I wish things could have been better. Right. But uh, Paul and Ken had, an issue, had some issues. And so Ken left. So uh, Sean told me the size that I was since Ken's gone and you're running a school by yourself now. Paul's job was to book towns. And you'd come in occasionally with, and, help, and help out with the students. But primarily I was the, I was now the, the head trainer of the Sean Michael Russ Academy. Right. So Sean said, you know, I'm gonna boost your pay, you know, and so he uh, I went from two fifty to five hundred a week and then he went up to fifteen hundred a week. And, uh, so paid off. There we go. You passed the warehouse job now. You, you, you surpassed the money from the warehouse now. Good job. Wife can't be too. Can't be too bad about that. Money. And then it wasn't fifteen hundred. It was like fifteen hundred for a month. And then, um, and then Paul and Sean had a fallout. So Paul left. See a recurring pattern here. And then so Sean mm-hmm. pulled me to the side again later on, and he said, "I'm going to increase your pay. I want you in charge of the school. I want you in charge of." of booking town so when everything was said and done I was I was up to making three grand a month um, at Shaw's school and and uh, still wasn't what well, I was making at the warehouse but it was it was workable though <laughs> you right know? right we should get close in the ballpark at least you know you know you're not, yeah. you're not a quarter of the, <laughs> a quarter of the pay man you know it's a, that's and, a big sacrifice and a big change man and I enjoyed it man I I, uh, I mean I got Brian Danielson and Brian Kendrick there and I had Lance Cage and then uh, okay. Michael Shane, Matt Bentley was Sean's nephew. He showed up, and then yeah. I mean, those are the guys that people hear about. But there are a lot of kids, man, that that came in there and they just—I don't know—they just lacked something. You know, it's hard to put your finger on when people say, "You know, it happened." You say, "Yeah, he has it," and then you say, "Okay, well, what is it? It's just what it. is it?" And you can't put your finger on what no. it is, but it is it. Some, there were a lot of kids that were very talented, very—I mean, you know. Uh, charismatic, and they just didn't have it. And uh, the, the crowd has to want to see you. They end up just being another face in the crowd, and they don't. The crowd's got to want to see you. They, they have to want to pay to see you, man. For some exactly. reason. Exactly. And and with Brian Kendrick and those guys, they mark, they put the bar at so high. You had to have. I mean, we didn't know what it was either. But Brian Danielson was very good. Brian, we didn't know what it was either. And Brian Kendrick was very good, and he got picked up and Lance Cade and. And there was a kid named Shooter Schultz. I mean, we didn't know what it was, but they had that it, you know. And and, and um, so we put their names out there. You know, they got, you know, Vince signed them. And some people say, well, yeah, they got signed because they were Sean's boys. The, the Brian and Brian are now full-grown adult men. Right. And, and, and Brian Kendrick has made some mistakes, and he's come back into the fold. Brian Danson had some issues. You know uh, medical issues, and they're still with the company. Mm-hmm. So the the thing of well, they're Sean's boys. That only holds so much water, man. And after a while, those boys are responsible for their own actions, and and they have to produce. You know, I mean, Vince isn't going to pay somebody a shitload of money because he's no. somebody's friend. Just somebody's because name, somebody's which friend. means nothing. Yeah. You know, if you're not drawing him money. He's not, yeah. You know, you're, you're gone. gone. Speaking of Danielson, you know. I'm a big fan of his. I've been watching him, you know, since ROH, and I've known about him since then. Just watching him, just be, a, you know, put on masterclass performances and be, you know, going over to New Japan and holding his own against some of those legends over there. It's just amazing to see somebody, who, you know, train, you know, going over to Japan and be able to handle handle themselves and be one of the best technical wrestlers in the world. You know, his in-ring so technical skills is what carries him on. It's like but, psychology in but the it's, ring. But also, you know, he can talk in a character work and he's funny. And the fact that, you know, he can change his character up. He can be a heel. He can be a baby face. Did you see all that in him when you were training him? Honestly, no. <laughs> but I love there that. was just something awesome. there. It was, 
it was just, I mean, he had great work ethic, great attitude. Um, he was very, Brian Denson was very dry. Uh, straight, the straight lace kind of guy. Be very contradictory, to contradict to what I'm saying, but right. he had no character. But he had a lot of character. He was, and that's what I'm saying, it was, he had that hit, you just don't know what it, you just can't put your finger on him. There's something about that guy that. I can see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it's just something there, so. Did he have, like, what, what a lot of people say is to make it in the industry, you got to be able to be molded and you got to be able to take constructive criticism and be humble. Is that all true? That was, there you go. That was Brian. And, and yeah. what, what, what Vince McMahon and, and JR and some of those guys have asked me was, you know, and they or have asked me is, are they coaching people? Yes. William Regal asked at all times. When I talk to him, and I'm like, hey, uh, I had this guy, the first thing William Regal will say is, is he coachable? Uh, and coachable means that, you know, if I tell you jump and you, you know, you say how high, uh-huh. not, so, hey, can you jump, no why. Um, and you ask why, you know, that? Yeah, no <laughs> why. Uh, do, you, do you want me to jump with my left foot or my right foot, how <laughs> high do you go? You're not being coachable, man, you're being hard-headed. Yes. Yeah. You know, just, just do what you're being asked to do and, and, and do the, to the best of your ability, and, and uh, you know, and, and so that's what they mean, it's, you know, are, are they coachable? And uh, so, yeah, they're, they're very coachable, you know, and, and uh, great attitudes and their work ethic was, you know, and I have a lot of guys in my wrestling school that are very good kids. Uh, there's just something lacking, you know, and, it's, and I look at them and I'm like, man, I wish I could help you, but it's like, I'll, I'll take you as far as I can, but at some point you're going to have to cover up, you know, whatever's missing, and I can't, I can't make you laugh, I can't make you, you know, that's that's within your makeup. That's in your DNA. So uh, you know they had those qualities, and and they're still there, man. They're still there. Yeah, the fact that you know, twenty years on, these guys are still getting the, getting that check. Like you said, and making that money at WrestleMania. I you just know, seen them, and the crowd was on fire. They love him. they love him still. It's amazing to see that you know after the neck injury, he comes back. And I, I never thought he'd wrestle again. I, I hated that, but you know, I was, you know, I'm always cringing watching him in the ring. Obviously, seeing what happened to him before. How do you, you know, have you experienced any kind of injuries like that? And obviously, not as bad as Daniel, but you know, what was you know one of your worst, you know, not not you know not your worst injury, but have you experienced any type of injuries like that while you're in the ring? So when I broke in, uh, I was taught how to bump. I was told you fall on your back or you fall on your front. Right. No, no one ever said you're gonna fall on your head. <laughs> no one ever said that you're gonna fall on your on your ass. Right. No one ever said you're gonna go through tables and light tubes. So, so my style of work is, and I'll do some stuff. I've, I've done stuff in the past. I've done moonsaults. I've done dives. But my style of work is just very safe. I don't do stupid shit to that that's gonna put me at risk. Or more importantly, put you at risk. Uh, if I do something like maybe like maybe a super kick, I'll tell the guy turn your head yep. and put your hand up. I'm not gonna kick your head off and then hope you know hope for the best. Mm-hmm. I, I try and, and, and I want I was always told you want the guy to go out to the ring in the same condition. Yes. That when he comes back to the ring, he's fine. I mean, there's no there's no issues. And so that's been the way I that's, that's been my deal for. Whatever for almost forty years now. Do you so think? Uh, question, do you think a lot of these guys substitute? Is, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Rudy. My the answer to your question is I have bumps and bruises from normal wear and tear. Right. But I've never had any back surgery. I've never had. You know, I've never been cut. I've never had any neck huh. injuries. Wow. I've never um, concussions. I don't think I've had concussions. Right. It's hard to tell. Very few. But I will tell you because I have asked questions, even taking bumps, even taking stupid little bumps can have the same effect as taking a chair shot. Yep. Maybe not one chair shot, maybe it may take 10 bumps mm-hmm. to have that same effect, but even taking bumps causes trauma to your brain. So that may be the only thing that I may have, I, because I'm not, you know, and I'm saying this in, on your on your, uh, on your your podcast very openly so that young guys can understand. I forget shit. I have mood swings. Ask, ask my girlfriend, like, one minute I'm, ha, 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 and the next minute I'm like, ah. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. Man. And 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 uh, you know, I love her to death, and she deals with it. You know, and it's you know, I'm not. You know, and, and, it, and it, I, I sit and I, and I think, you know, shit, this is happening to me, but uh, it's controllable. You know, it, it, as long as you are aware of what you are dealing with, yeah. you figure out a way to deal with it. So I try and not let, like, whatever situations happen where that may piss me off, I don't get pissed. I just let it roll off my back and, and uh, you know, I, if, if you... If you want to create drama, then create drama. Do it on your own time. I'm not going to mess with it. it takes you too know, much um, energy to be pissed off all the time. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I've seen guys. I've seen guys my age that they're always, rah, 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 mm-hmm. and I'm like, calm down, dude. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, and they're nice guys, you know. Uh, they're just, you know, and I'm not I'm not saying they have any head injuries or anything. Like, they have any mental issues. But with the research that I've done, I mean, there's a possibility, you know. Yeah, um, for sure. So it's just something I'm aware of, you know. Again, I've never, I've never been cut open. I've never had neck injuries or broken arm. I've never broken, I've never broken a body part. I've never. Not coming for that, yes, sir. You know, I, I, but I've been lucky, I guess. Uh, I do. I will say there was one time uh, I was changing, and like, I don't know. Eric Emery said, "What's wrong with your knee?" And I'm like, "I don't know." And I look at it, and my knee from the middle of my shin to halfway up my thigh was black and blue and purple it was just like this ugly color and uh, I was like holy shit and then he said uh, he said uh, does it hurt and I'm like no I don't feel anything and I kept stopping my leg and you know whatever and I'm like no I was stopping my leg before the legs last became popular but anyway, <laughs> uh, I was like well, no it hurt at all Eric Ember, it's big and so I kept watching it and over over the course of like four or five days it slowly started disappearing but it never hurt me or anything. I don't know what it was. I don't. It, I don't know what it was. And I don't remember falling on my leg the wrong the wrong way or anything. I, that, that's the only thing that, that's if anything in, in, my, in all my years of wrestling. Well, that's the only you know I guess injury that I really injury? Had. Right. <laughs> the only randomly. I don't know where that came from. Kind of injury. That's awesome, man. That's and you know what? It's because you weren't safe. It's funny. You know, you, yeah. you didn't end I up mean, getting I, hurt. I, I did get. Okay, well, I, I did get my tooth knocked out, uh, and that was just me being stupid. And letting a, a green kid, he's never had a, a match before, and he went, and this one kid showed up in Temple, Texas, and uh, he was with another guy, and this guy was trying to be his manager and all this stuff, and, yeah. and uh, so the, you know, Tom's boy asked, well, who trained you? And the, the one guy said, well, we trained in our backyard and stuff. And so the kid was a good looking guy, he had, a, <laughs> he had a decent build on him and stuff, and so Tom's boy asked, well, what kind of background do you have? So the guy said, you know, he was like a fifth degree black belt or, or something, you know, and he knew this, he knew that, and also. So Jonathan Boyd asked everybody in the dressing room, anybody want to work twice? And everybody heard this, and nobody raised their hand. I was the knucklehead that said, oh, no. I'll work with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work with him. They got and, you. Uh, so Boyd, Jonathan Boyd told me to the side and said, uh, you might be legit, mate, so just be careful. I said, that's cool. Well, I was always I was always taught uh, a good wrestling guy to be a good you know boxing guy, a good kickboxer guy. I was you know wrestling is like the king of sports, so I had that mentality. So um, we got in the ring, and I asked the guy, "What can you do?" He said, well, "I can do kicks, I can do uh, uh, strikes, and I can do." I said, "Okay, well, we'll work we'll work around your karate stuff, whatever." And so we got in the ring, and we didn't talk about nothing in the back. We didn't, we didn't do that back then anyway. Right. And so we got in the ring, and he took my, I said, take my arm. He takes my arm. I said, kick me. And uh, the referee said, I felt one gun in my face. <laughs> my oh, no. <laughs> and I was quick. Whack. <laughs> but the referee said he kicked me three times. No, oh, man. <laughs> so he really wasn't fit to be black, though. In, in, in rapid six session. Right. <laughs> Three-piece combo. And, uh, so I remember feeling a thud, and then everything, I could hear things, but everything was black. So now we and know I could hear, no like, uh, the referee right. saying, you know, and it sounded just like in the movies, like, Rudy, you okay? Rudy, are you okay? And I was like, holy cow, and he has his hand out, and he has his piece of white something in his, two pieces of white something in his hand, 
and I reach for it, and it's my tooth. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, no. And the kid kicked me three times, so he kicked me three broke. And I started feeling with my tongue this gap in my mouth, and I went off. I was like, ah! And I was like, <laughs> I do, and I was lucky, because I think if you would have figured out that I was, I was throwing live rounds, I think you would have jacked me up. Yeah, you might have knocked the rest of those teeth out. <laughs> You might be gumming some food today. I threw, caught him right on the top of the forehead, and he went down, and I went on top of him. And then I grabbed him, I started nailing him, and then I hooked him. And the referee was like, Rudy, Rudy, I'm like, pet him, pet him, pet him. <laughs> and so the referee jumped down, he got a one, two, three, and I got out of the ring. That's it. And, I mean, I got blood pouring out of my mouth. I was spitting these gobs, gobs of blood out wow. of my mouth. And I go to the back, and Johnson boy is like, you okay, mate? And I'm like, fuck, what the, you know. Sorry about that. And I'm dropping the F-bomb. How you good? How you good, man? And Boyd is like, oh, my God, you need to see a doctor. And so I grab my stuff, and I walk out. The guy comes back, and they're like, hey, MS, what the, you know, what the F, what the F? And so I went after him again, but everybody grabbed his post part. And so Boyd, I remember when I was leaving, Boyd told the guy, uh, this is a free you, mate. You got to go. You got to go. You got to leave, man. We, we can't have that stuff here. He goes, you just injured my guy. And the guy was like, F this, F that. So I heard he ended up giving his stuff, and or he threw his stuff out the back door, and he left. Um, but that, that's the only, I mean, that was the only, after that, I never put my guard down. You know, like, 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 like I just, I was just listening to the Kevin Nash deal with, with uh, Steve Austin, and he was talking about, he mentioned something about just being able to get in the ring and just relax and just do stuff and not worry about, you know, and that's what I totally, because after, up to that point, I just got in the ring and just did stuff with guys and not worry about anything. But after that, you know, I was always weary of this guy. Does this guy really know what he's doing? Is he gonna? So the guy said, "Come you know, make money and come for a fist fight." <laughs> right? I made sure I watched his foot, or I make sure I watch where they're gonna kick me at, so that they don't, you know, and I get ready so I don't, you know, so I'll get my rib broken or no my taters. face smashed in or something, right? you know. You know, it's, it's crazy that, you know, these guys, like you said, the guy was green, so he didn't know what the hell he was doing. But, you know, you t they got you all day to go out there and take on the green guy, man. Well, unfortunately, but, you know, no, no, no major injuries, man. That's impressive, though. After, what, five decades in the business, no major injuries? Uh, I'd say you're probably one of the only people that I, that I can think that actually has gone that long. No yeah. broken bones. Yeah, no structural damage. Before. I mean, no tears or ligaments. And I think no that, that has a lot to say about technical and the safe wrestling, that yeah, as long as you follow both those and you have good ring psychology, that you can fill seats. You don't need to do backflips. No. You don't need to have death matches. No. Use every bit of equipment in the building to beat the shit out of the next guy. If it's a good yeah. wrestling match, it's a good wrestling exactly. match. Exactly. The people and inside I, the ring. And, I, and, I, and I've had guys say, we never wrestled anybody, anybody besides, man, I wrestled Brody. I wrestled Slater, Jeez. I wrestled Manny Fernandez, I wrestled Yokozuna, I wrestled Papa Shanga, I wrestled some heavyweight guys, I mean some major players, you know, and, and and we all took care of each other, man, and and, and, uh, and they're all guys that were in the business for a long time, and they, if I think if they worked hard, it was, was Bruiser as hard as they say, stiff-wise, in the ring? So there's a difference between being stiff and being, and being snug. dangerous, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he was snug. Okay, he was so snug, like, snug, snug. Okay, snug. so with me, he was snug. If he forearmed me in the back, I felt it. If he kicked me in the head, I felt it. Uh, but I've also seen guys have refereed several of his matches. I've also seen guys where kick guys' heads across the damn arena. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like holy cow. And it, it mainly was because the guys didn't didn't uh, work with him. Right. You know, I mean, if, if Bruiser Brody hits you, you better, you better, mm -hmm. se you better sell. You better move sell. the yeah. way the Bruiser you know, wants you to move. Don't try and be Superman and stand there because then the next one's going to be, you know. <laughs> it's a live round. Next one's, one's a live round for sure. Yeah, I, I heard that. Guys, I've seen them just tear guys up. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, it's like, and then the guys go to the back. Like, I don't know why you didn't. I don't know why you kicked me so hard. Well, shit, you're not selling for Well, the you first time he didn't kick you so hard. And you weren't moving the way you were supposed to move, so the second time you made sure you moved the way you wanted you to move. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we did a match, and and uh, he backed me in the ropes, and he said, he 
said, crack me back. And so he forearmed me in the chest and and uh, caved in my chest. <laughs> but I forearmed him back. Um, like a punk. <laughs> and he said, lay it in. And he forearmed me back in the chest. Lay that thing in, man. He caved it in. And so I waved, I waylaid my arm back and I nailed him as hard as I could. Oof. And I broke my own arm. No, I didn't break my arm. <laughs> Hurt you going, man. <laughs> and then he cut me off. He gave me a knee or something, whatever. Of course. And then um, we go to the back, and then one of the guys was like, you hit, you hit Brody. He told and me I'm to. like, yeah. He goes, did he tell you to? I'm like, yeah, I think he did. And uh, so the guy, this guy Bobby was like, man, I hope he's not pissed at you. And I was like, and I was thinking myself, did I imagine him saying, hit me back? So when he came to the back, he called me over and he says, if I say crack me, lay it in. Don't be afraid. Lay it in. I don't mind. It was lay it in. You know, we got to get these people to believe. Lay it in. Don't be afraid. Lay it in. And he kept me, he said, lay it in, like, many, many, many times. And so that's, you know, so now my mentality when I'm doing my matches, and, you can, and he said, you can, lay, you can lay your shit in without hurting the guy. You know, you're, it's all, you know, you hit a guy that four, it's all right, right, right. the right way, you hit him with all me chest and he has pecs it's all meat you're not breaking no bones right you know you can you, can, you, can, you, can, lay it, you can lay your stuff in without hurting the guy so don't be afraid lay it in and to this day man i tell my guys lay your shit in lay your shit in and some guys like well i don't want to hurt him i'm right, not gonna hurt I'm, him I'm, I'm, I'm showing you how to do this stuff without hurting the guys so if i'm saying lay it in i'm telling you to do whatever it is yeah. i told you to do because i know you if you're doing it the way i'm telling you to do you're not gonna hurt the guy Lay your stuff in. And if you do, oops, it happens. This is a ballet. You know, it's it's a physical line of work, but you gotta lay your stuff in. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that you know, you see the guys they're snug and you can you know, it looks tight and looks good. This is supposed to look a certain type of way. And you know, you can do it without hurting each other. You know, that's the that's the art of rest professional wrestling. It's supposed to look right. like organized chaos, it's supposed to look like combat, it's supposed to look like a struggle. It's not supposed to be synchronized ballet. You know, and right. speaking of that, you know, how do you feel about today's product? So it's kind of like a catch twenty two. Today's today today's athletes, today's talent is uh, as a whole is in far better shape than <laughs> the guys that I broke in with. Like Certainly. like a, like a, a normal wrestling night was was a, <clears throat> guys would do their shows. And then, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to drop names, but I mean, I'm not saying anything that nobody knows, but guys will no, no. have beer, drink, and, and hang out at the bars. Some guys yeah. would pop pills, some guys would do coke, some guys would, so you know, doing, back yeah. in the 80s, we were rock, you know, we had the rock star mentality. Right. I didn't do any of that stuff. I didn't, I drank, but I never did the drugs, never did the steroids, never did, you know, um, I was in wine, wine because I was chicken shit. I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to get involved in that stuff. Um, Right. But today's today's talent, I, I rarely see guys having you know going out and drinking beer and getting shit faced and then driving. It wasn't uncommon to go to you know, Austin, Texas, like uh, sixty miles from San Antonio. It wasn't uncommon to do a show in Austin, Texas, go to the bar, get drunk, shit faced, and then drive sixty miles <laughs> home. That's DWI. Uh, but guys did it on the, you know, nightly, and, and, and not just Austin, but just other towns, you know, guys would go out have, or guys would, would, uh, guys would, you know, stop at the local ice house or gas station, get a 12-pack of beer and drive on the way home. You know, that wasn't uncommon. That was, you know, that, you know, and, uh, and, and, and uh, is it wrong? Yeah, it's wrong. It's, 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 you know, over container laws and stuff like that. Of but course. Mm-hmm. That's what guys did. That's what I did, you know. Um, Sign of the times, man. Yeah, but but the kids today, I don't see that as much, and I certainly don't see kids dealing with the the prescription drugs and stuff like that. So you see less overdoses. There was a time here, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, where every every morning you'd wake up, who's going to be, you know, who's next? Who's, who's next? next? Who's next? You know, you now, I mean. Uh, Paul Orndorff just passed away yes, uh, of, of, of actual health issues, not 
Natural causes. Uh, yeah. Not it was an overdose. Not you know. I mean, and it's kind of you know. I hate saying this, but it's kind of refreshing to see that he actually lived a full life. Right. Could he have lived longer? Sure, he could have. But he didn't die at forty years old. He didn't die at thirty years old. He Some complications he was or something else. There was a natural you know, a natural thing, and you know he lived you know a decently long you know lifespan. It wasn't overdosing or driving yeah. his car into a tree or some stupid like that, and, you know. And kids today aren't, aren't into that stuff. Uh, at least, I mean, from where I'm at, like, like uh, you know, I, like I said, I run the wrestling school, and the most I see, the biggest deal I see are kids smoking weed. Right. And I'm not a weed smoker advocate. I'm not, you know, I'm not into that stuff. Uh, but I get it. And that's, and that's fine. You know, I know some guys are, you know, it's a natural drug and stuff like that. Right. Fine. But Playing from Earth. <laughs> that's the biggest thing I see today. Um, but, so kids aren't doing the, the drugs and stuff like the older guys, like, you know, the guys who I broke in, but they're doing stupid shit in the ring. Like, right. You know, so like, the terrible exchange, right? Pop pills, but they're killing themselves in the ring by doing stuff they don't get to do. Right. You know, and that and that's sad because, I mean, they're like Ricochet. I... I, I haven't seen him I, for a while there. He was on social media every week with Will Osprey doing some these outstanding still... uh, moves and these choreographed matches, and then they were great matches. But that's not real. That's not no. You know, it's not, it's I, not I, I like and I like watching him. Yes, I do. But in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking, really, this is a wrestling yeah. match. Wrestling match. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so my my. Uh, my uh, my disbelief in that match is out the window. Yeah. Because nothing there is in. It's you know, impossible. I always, I always I always watch matches as, uh, or I try and perform matches as if I was in a fight in a bar. Punch, kick. That's what's supposed elbow, to be. Grab a hold on the guy, crank on it. And, yeah. And Choke him out. That type of stuff. Johnny Valentine type of stuff. Hmm. Um, at no point are you gonna if a guy grabs my girlfriend's ass. I'm not gonna push him and do three back flips. This is the Michael Jackson uh, video. <laughs> and then run by him and jump off the wall and then cross body. You, know, <laughs> you don't do that stuff. Yeah, sometimes well, doing well, it so helps much. you doing it. The thing is, like, it takes away. The thing that gets me is the cooperation. My God, you guys are helping each other yeah. do moves to each other. Really? Uh, that that to me is the most egregious error in professional wrestling. And when I see that in a match, I'm, I'm done. My brain shuts off. I'm like, no, no, you lost the plot. You don't know what this, you've just taken me completely out of it. You're helping the other person beat you up? Yeah. Is what you're trying to tell me right now. It's just not logical. It just it doesn't, I, I don't understand. I'm going to leave CJ here for one second. I'm going to step over on live and get some fan questions, if, see if anyone's on. CJ's going to continue with you. I mean, um, my career, I mean, you know, Back then, we were all told, "Don't, don't uh, insult the fans." Right. And and uh, and, I, and today, guys are like, "Oh yeah, so uh, we're really supposed to believe that a dead man is really, you know, uh, a zombie is really, yeah, you know, really oh, you know, referring to Undertaker." Well, yeah, there are some, you know, there's some exceptions to the rule, but right. you see matches, and it's like the whole match is an exception to the rule, you know, and you know, and, and so um, I think. I think um, it takes to to, 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 uh, to produce a good wrestling match. It takes time to uh, how can I put this? It takes time for things to develop. So, for example, if I nail a guy in the head, um, that guy has to take a couple of seconds at least to acknowledge he got punched in the head, hold his head. Rub his jaw, um, you know, blink his eye or something, some, something, just something that says I got clocked. Right. Um, and instead, I see like I just posted a video the other day of two guys, very good kids, in NXT, and I like the matches. Right. But there was no, at no point, one kid got kicked in the back of the head. No so. And he just, he just stood there with his arms down, and then the other kid did something else, and he moved, and he did something, and it was like, come on, guys, you know, and they do. A thousand things in a ten minute match when maybe ten would have worked. Ten ten works and the crowd's with you just the same. Exactly, 
Exactly. Save it for next match. So I think today's athletes, I think today's talent is uh, as a whole are far better than yesterday's talent. Like like physically for uh, sure. It's, you know, physically yes. and training wise for sure. Hundred percent. Like I don't like I don't think Walter McDaniel could hang with Keith Lee. Not a chance. You know, but Keith Lee, because Keith Lee can move around the ring like a son of a gun. Moon Salton, the 350, like, you know. Yeah. But does he need but the Moon Salt 350? But Wahoo wouldn't, you know, a, a chop from Wahoo would shut all that stuff down. Right. And make, and he would make, he would still get Keith Lee over, you know. Right. And I like Keith Lee. Keith Lee's a big kid, and he's very athletic, and that's great. So For sure. I, I'm not knocking him. But a lot of stuff he does, you just don't have to do, man. You just don't have to do it. Just... Tell a story, yeah. you know. Like, um, you know, your knees, your knees and joints will thank you later, brother. Like, I understand. I appreciate the fact that you can do a moonsault. I don't ever want to see it. I never I, need to see Keith Lee doing a moonsault or a backflip. I need to see Keith Lee being a big old bear, putting his paws on people, and whooping them, and burying them in the ground. That's what. He, that's, that's the visual you should be putting off. And like, you shouldn't be cartwheeling around with 180 pound guys and having them. You know, having competitive matches with them, and you know, you should be burying those guys, eat them up, squash them. You know, when you get to the big matches with big guys, yeah, when you get in a match with Dijakovic, he's six seven two, he's six seven two fifty. Yeah, I can believe that. I want them to slug it out, but I don't need to see Keith Lee having a competitive, you know, exhibition match. You know, choreographed with a hundred and fifty pound five foot ten guy. It just, it just doesn't look right. Exactly, exactly, and, 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 you know, wrestling fans know what they're, they're not stupid. No, no, They know what they're buying that ticket for. They know exactly what they're seeing. Of course. They're seeing, uh... It's just they, like people who buy a movie ticket. You know Keanu Reeves is not going to shoot people in the head, okay? But guess what? Right. You love John Wick. Because you can suspend animation, you can suspend the belief. We know that, exactly. we know what's going on. But don't insult my intelligence by showing me something insane. They, they know what they're buying. They know they're, you go to a strip club, you know all those girls in that strip It's like, I, I use this comparison also. You go to a strip club, you know all those girls have a boyfriend, a of husband. Um, they're not working their way to college. <laughs> They've got... They got kids. At 45, they're going to college. Yeah. <laughs> They've got lives like all of us. So when you go in there, you sit with a girl, you're not going to take her home. No. You're not going to score. No. You're not going to, you know, whatever you think you're going to get done with, with the, you know, with candy. Right. It's not going to happen. She's there to take your fucking money. The experience yeah. ends at that door. At the, <laughs> that door, it's over. And that, yeah, and that's her job. Yes. Her job is to uh, I hate using this word, but her job is to work you exactly. into sleeping her, buying her drinks, uh, sitting with you and telling you what you want to hear. Oh, you're so handsome. Man, I go to a strip club and I'm like the most handsomest guy and I'm baby and I'm whatever and, you know, and, oh, yeah. and, uh, you know you're, are you Sweet. married? No, I'm not. Oh, you got to be married. You can't be. A man like you, you can't be single. Uh, <laughs> okay. you, know, uh, you know, it's like, what does she see in me that everybody doesn't, you know? So they're working you to try and to try and make money. The strippers are just like wrestlers. Our, our strippers are like wrestlers should be. Today, guys are just outright telling the public it's bullshit. It's not real. We're friends. Yeah. This guy took me to my limits uh, last night. I wrestled so and so. You know, and it's not. And so I feel like they're leaving money on the table. For sure. Because there are fans out there that want they they know it's BS. They know but they want to get involved in that that uh, uh, that drama that that we create, um, you know. And, and they want to be able to yell and you suck and that type of, that type of stuff. But if you see a guy doing three flips and uh, two head scissors and four uh, Canadian destroyers, <laughs> how can you tell? How can you tell he sucks? <laughs> like, like, yeah, he's, pretty, he's pretty good. <laughs> Right? So it, it looks good. Know, guys, guys don't want that. They don't want that. Uh, I will say, the guys don't want that smoke. They don't want. They don't want to be hated because if they're hated, then you can't sell merchandise. You can't sell T-shirts. You can't sell. 
and they have to sell that merchandise because they're not getting not money enough. from the promoter like they want, like they feel they should get. Yep. Instead of getting 150 bucks or 200 bucks or 300 bucks because fans come to see that guy get his ass beat, they're charging the promoter you know, 20 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever, and they're hoping that they sell 10 t-shirts and 25, you know, 8x10s and, and stuff like that um, because they're not getting it done. Their work isn't getting it done right. for them. So if you have I to go and plan your match around t shirt sales. I think, <laughs> you know? I think that's the You're biggest very far. I think that's the biggest issue with guys today is they're so worried about selling merch. You go to any Facebook post and you'll see some guy and you talk about matches and stuff and you'll see somebody bring up merch. And yeah. in nineteen eighty two we never that word didn't even exist. Yeah, we sold T shirts and stuff, but Tully Blanchard never came up to me and say, um, Hey, can you sell my merch? Or Tito <laughs> Hernandez never came up to me and say, Hey, can you sell my merch? Or Wahoo, can you sell my merch? Or, you know, I mean, it, guys guys were making money and guys were making a living on their work. You know, and that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest their work uh, sold the product. Yeah. problem with wrestling today. I mean, again, like I said, the kids today are in far better shape uh, than, than the guys were. You know, back then, and they can do a lot of stuff, but they also a lot, a lot of guys like Brad, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Armstrong? Armstrong. Yeah. Brad Armstrong Amazing. Could, do, could probably do the same shit Ricochet can. Sure could. If not, very close. Yep. Brad Armstrong is very athletic. Brad Armstrong could move like a cat. Yep. He just never did that stuff because that just wasn't. Didn't need you know, to. I mean, they didn't have to. Yeah, Brad Armstrong's one of the toughest tech, you know, tech before Daniel Bryan, like, you know, right. that technical wrestling aspect, wrestle a ring around people. He didn't need to go do the high fly and the flips and all that, because it wasn't, it was, people would have looked at him like he had three heads. You imagine if you went up and did uh, some kind of crazy, you know, 720 twist in the middle of some marina in Memphis in the territory days or somewhere in Texas. But what the hell is that boy lost his damn mind? If you don't get off that top rope, it was it was illegal to throw somebody over the top rope in some of the territories. So you at my right. point, it was illegal to, to jump, jump over the top, top rope. rope. So it's like you know, it's not there for that. You know, I can see there's a niche for it, but when it's taking over and it's become the norm for everybody to be doing it, you know, the main eventers are doing it. The main event guys should never be on top rope to me. Jump off uh, on topic a little bit. A couple fan questions I got regarding uh, your WWE WWF time. Uh, you had a, a vignette with JBL. They said, "How was it working with him?" Layfield. How was JBL is, uh, is working with Layfield? Uh, Bradshaw. Yeah, JBL is a hell of a nice guy. Okay. It's a lot of fun doing that stuff with him. Um, uh, someone just posted on Facebook the other day. How in the world or Twitter? How in the world did WWE do this stuff? Do do this vignette or whatever? Uh, this was done like in, I don't know, mid-90s or so, not mid-90s, it was like that? in uh, uh, 2006 or something. Uh, this, was when, this was right to start the Eddie Guerrero deal. Ah, uh, with yeah. the bull rope match? With the... Uh, that what? With the bull rope match? No, it was when J- JBL played like a border... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, border, border, okay, border yeah, patrol yeah. or yeah, something. Yeah, okay. This was, right, yeah. this was done right before JBL had the match with Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero bled like the stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Um, but I mean, it was just—it's just a—it's just a, a promo. It's just a big news. It's just—he's not a racist. Oh no, no. He's not, and I'm, paid I'm not a, I'm <laughs> They, they just—I uh, think he had kind of carries the. Uh, but the bully kind the, of. The, I'm a bully or an asshole behind the scenes kind of thing. I think they were wondering if he was like that. You know, good to work with, or if he was. Maybe that's just yeah, other yeah. people's opinion. Yeah, no, I mean, even, even at that, I don't, I don't consider, I never considered JBL a bully of any type. Guys did ribs, and JBL was one of the yes. chief Steiner brothers did them. The ones that considered, considered him a bully are the ones that couldn't take a rib. Exactly. So yeah, some guys just couldn't, just didn't appreciate being ribs. Some guys, but I mean, uh, so there's a story where I think JBL taped uh, somebody to one of those. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the post. Crazy, crazy yeah. Down the ramp at before SmackDown, or something, and 
and uh, you know, he was being a bully, and that's all messed up. And no, it was funny. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He to, he if he didn't to like it, he wouldn't have done it to you, kind of thing. Exactly. You know, I saw I saw a guy. I saw there was a guy down there named Cowboy Lang. He was a rigid wrestler, and so Alva Drill got his cowboy hat. Oh, and yep. Nailed him to cool. a wall. Like oh. Cowboy Lang was like four feet tall, and with his arm length was like four. You know, maybe maybe four and a half feet tall. Could have reached the so hat. Alva Drill nailed his cowboy hat like four feet and eight inches yeah. high. And so Cowboy Lang was getting ready to go out to the ring and he's like, where's my hat, where's my hat? And his hat's hanging on the wall. And so he, can't, he just can't reach it. He's like jumping, jumping, jumping. And the whole dressing room is like laughing their ass. <laughs> like, I mean, because it looks funny, this midget yeah. guy trying to it's jump. It's hilarious. And he's like, yeah. yeah. And he's like, you fucking asshole. Give me a fucking cat. Give me a cat. I'm going to kick somebody's ass. And you know, just, everyone's just laughing their ass off. And finally somebody, you know, gives him his hat. And he's like, you guys think they're funny, huh? And he's even laughing. They got me. You got me. You guys think they're funny. <laughs> you know, and it was like. It was you know, all in good fun. He never, yeah, man. He never came back and said, you, you, you effing bullies. You guys are a bunch of. No one ever, you know. So, I mean, JBL is a nice guy. I work with him and, he, and I know him and he's a good guy and stuff. And, and awesome. uh, it was great good working that deal with him. I had fun. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was cool. Another one was uh, your schooler. Is Texas back with COVID and everything? Are you guys back open for training? We never stopped. Never Atta stopped. Boy. Awesome. Had a boy. Yeah, we never. So COVID popped up. Uh, we had like shutdown rules and stuff the first part of March, the middle of March or so. And I had just had some guys that moved one kid from North Carolina, one kid from North Texas or West Texas. And I called them and I said, hey guys, uh, we're under restriction. Uh, what do you guys want to do? I mean, they had just moved down here. They just got leases for their apartments, and they were settled. And I said, yeah. I know you guys, you know, I don't know how long this is going to last, so what do you guys want to do? And they're like, well, what can we do? And I said, uh, so the restrictions are, you can't have more than 10 guys in a room. Uh, you have to maintain uh, social distancing. In wrestling, that's kind of hard to do. Yeah. I said, um, you have to, they say you have to sanitize everything, wash your hands, you know, that type of stuff, wear a mask, um, get your temp- temperatures done. I said, I'll have a guy taking temperatures at the front door. So, but if you guys feel sick, heavy, fever, soreness, anything, do not come to the gym. Uh, and on my end, I will... I'll wipe the ring down with bleach and whatever. I will sanitize it after every training. Um, I had 15 guys that I was training at the time, and then um, everyone except for four or five said, you know, hey, um, I'm not going to come to training until this thing is over with, which I understood. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So that dropped down my my, uh, students to seven guys. With these two guys, eight guys. So I'm under the 10 10 person limit rule um, and so we just trained we just you know we, we I got masks for everybody yeah, mm-hmm. their masks were hard to were hard to breathe in and uh, cause we do a lot of cardio and so at half the time the masks were sloping down under the guy's nose and stuff so it was doing no good anyway so I was like alright we're gonna take the masks off but when you guys are not in the ring stay apart 10 feet apart that's the rule state. 10 mm-hmm. feet apart yeah. I go if you guys do anything else it's on you so we never, we never missed, we never stopped training. We kept That's going. awesome. You guys, you didn't have to lose exactly. out on a whole year of training. And, yeah. you know, we never, I never had one guy sick. Not one. One guy had called and said, you know, hey, I don't feel good. All right, stay home. And he did, and he came back the next day. He goes, yeah, I just 24-hour flu. I'm fine. None of my guys ever, and, you know, knock on wood or knock on whatever, got to knock on, but yeah. none of my guys ever got sick. I never got sick. And... And uh, throughout the, the deal, we tra- I traveled. But my, my, uh, me and my girlfriend, Michael, went to Tennessee, went to Florida, went to Georgia, went to Missouri, went to Louisiana. Went to, we, we, we stayed traveling. There you go. I traveled as well. I didn't yeah. get sick either. <laughs> yeah, but the thing was that in my truck, I always had a bottle of sanitizer. Yes, sir. As we get in from the grocery store or restaurant or wherever. Which it, it, that was a crazy point in life to and tell and the world you have to wash your hands. Down the steering wheel and, you know, we kept... Uh, I didn't walk around with a mask 24-7 like a lot of people did. No, yeah. But I did respect 
the stores and whatever, if they say you have to wear a mask, and I put one on, and I should walk out the door and take it back off. Mm-hmm. That's how it was same year. That you had to walk in a lot of establishments with, a, like a restaurant, with, a, with, with your mask on. And then you can take it off once you sit down. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then you didn't have to wear it when you're walking out. So did COVID exist outside the doors when you walk in? <laughs> yeah. when you walk out? We asked the same thing. Yes. I think, <laughs> I think there Texas were, and Florida had a right. lot of the same, uh, yeah. you know, we're not going to deal with this shit kind of an attitude. Yeah. Same type of situation here. A lot of the country, they're still, to this day, freaking out wearing masks. We haven't, I haven't seen someone with a mask on in Florida in a couple months. Yeah. <laughs> Florida and Texas, very, very similar reaction to the, to the thing. So we're kind of the same way. You know, we do what we need to do. If I need to go wear a mask in the store, I'll do it. Obviously, you know, respect that. I respect, you know, people who are more sickly. You know, I did my, take my precautions. So, but you know, I wasn't gonna let it control my entire life, and you know, I still need, still need to make a living, man. You know, the bills, the bill collectors don't care about your COVID. That's the one Not thing that all. I found out. So, when bill collectors stop caring about, so you know, stop caring about COVID, then we'll stop working. But you know what? I still got my electric bill, still got my water bill, my, my truck note came out every month. So I'm like, I'm gonna go to work to make my money. It just is what it is. You know? Exactly. And you know, I, like, you're gonna come pay my bills? I don't think so. So, you know, let us do what we got to do. And I felt bad for a lot of people because they got kicked out of their apartments. Crazy. Or man. their job yep. got shut down or their company got shut down or, you know, and it's like, you know, and then, and then the, you know, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to turn this into a... No, no. Uh, okay, hey, listen, we, we're, 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 we're talking, we can we talk. And the president and, and everybody else was like, we're going to compensate you for 3000 Yeah. Those checks were far, few and far in between. I mean, right. you know, I think... I think they sent out one check and then like six months later you have a check. Like, yeah, and if that if that six hundred or twelve hundred yeah. really changed your life, <laughs> Bro, you were in a rough you, spot you, anyway. Your life was already going out of crap anyway, man. <laughs> I, I haven't gotten to this date. I haven't gotten one check yet. Me like, neither. Me either. You know, and, and my girlfriend's like, you know, aren't you worried about it? And I'm like, no. no. I mean, it's not gonna. Send my money in the first you know, place. Yeah, help with the bills, but I'm not gonna. No. I'm not dying. You know, it's yeah, I'm not gonna go I'm hungry. Not, I'm not homeless. It wasn't my money in the first place. <laughs> That's not, not gonna yeah. half. You got any uh, words of wisdom to uh, young men and women who are coming into the business? Words of wisdom. Um, if this is what I tell my guys all the time, there's several, several, uh, several things. If this is what you want to do, then this is what you're gonna do. Don't jump into progressing because your dream and your you know, it's in your blood and all that other stuff. I get, I get emails. I'll send them to you. Emails. Every yeah. email I get, it's in my blood. It's right. my passion. It's my dream. It's my lifetime. And then when you say, okay, um, do, you know, do 500 squats. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, hey, what happened to that passion, bro? What happened to that dream? What I was dreaming about it. <laughs> um, then they realized that's all it was, was a dream. Yeah, right. Don't, don't, don't let, don't let guys other people don't let don't let other things distract you life's full of distractions I have a girl training with me and uh, she has been hit with a I mean with a ton of distractions she started training and she was in horrible shape and she suffered for it she she trained uh, Monday uh, did, did well she trained Tuesday she did well she did she trained Wednesday, she did she struggled a little bit, and then she called me Thursday and said, I can't get out of bed. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? She said, I don't know, I can't move my legs, I can't do this, can't do that. I said, well, maybe she should go see a doctor. So she went to go see a doctor. They admitted her into the hospital. She was in the hospital for like two or three weeks because all of her levels, her sugar, blood, iron, everything, anything that, that you need in your, in your body to help you survive, shut down. Everything in her, everything about her just shut down. Her glucose, her glucose, her wow. hepat- whatever, anything you think of, she could. And the doctors were like, "You could, you could die." Yeah. Mm-hmm. She was dehydrated. She was. I mean, she was just completely. She was. I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, let's not worry about doing anything. Let's just get better. She said, "Well, I want to start training." I'm like, "You can't. You can't, you can't train. You no. Can't. You're gonna die in the ring. It's not gonna happen." So she was in the hospital for two weeks, and then. She said, okay, I can come back now. I said, what did the doctor say? And she said, well, I have this, 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 this. I said, all right, well, you know, you're not coming back in here. And I make all my guys take physical before they even start. Mm-hmm. And so when she oh, took her a medical, they, just, you. You know, they just did a, her, they, you know, checked her heart rate and, you know, cough and that type of stuff. 
So all this stuff they didn't, they couldn't figure, they didn't, you know, they never, they never checked for it. So I said, what did the doctor say? And she said, the doctor said, I can't do any physical activities until I get, okay, okay that's all you gotta say. You're not doing any physical activity until you get all this shit straightened out. Right. So she went and got herself a personal trainer. She got, and a lot of it has to do with just her diet. Like she diet. got, uh, he put her on a diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, she did some physical, uh, she did some personal training with him. And uh, six weeks later, she, you know, she, her diet was better. She gained some size on her, on her, you know, her waist or whatever, and lost some weight, and did some other stuff, whatever. And uh, so she came in and started training again. So she went to the physical, they checked everything, she, and they, 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 uh, they said she was okay. She came back and started training. So two weeks after she starts training, she gets kicked in the back. And she fractured a rib, or Whoa. something happened with one of her ribs, and so she is like, I can't breathe. I'm like, so go get an x-ray. So she went and got an x-ray done, they said she had a fractured rib. All right, sit down, you ain't doing shit until your rib's fine. So she was out another three or four weeks, and um, cool. and then she ended up, because she, she was hurt all the time, Man. she had to lose her, she had to lose her job. What? Yeah, so. So it was like one thing after another, after okay. another. So she lost her job, and then you know she, you know she just struggles, 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 but she hasn't quit, and she will not quit. And and uh, that's that dedication was, you were talking I about. Was, yeah. I always joke with her about you know you can't do this, you can't do that because you're a girl, and she's like f you. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean she just you know she's like I'm not gonna let anything stop me. The like, don't, and I mean, and she said, and I'm sure a lot of guys that are into wrestling that have been trained, they, they, they can relate to this. She's had family members. Why are you doing this? You're wasting your time. You'll never amount to anything. You're not gonna do anything, it's not gonna work. You're wasting your time, you're wasting your money. You can do something else. You can, and, and she's had wars with her family. And I've had several students that have, that, that have told me the same thing. She's not letting it stop her. And I, and I tell my guys, if this is what you wanna do, yeah, yeah. Then this is what you're gonna do. Don't let distractions stop you from doing whatever. If if anything, get with somebody. Your mom and dad made my mom. My parents weren't. Uh, you know, my parents didn't, didn't support me in, in wrestling either. Uh, if if you got guys that are that are knocking you, then get around. Get away from them. Yeah, yeah even if they're family member, get away from them and get around people that will support you. Gabe Sapolsky, a ring of, well, he was a Ring of Honor. He was a Nick Ball. Now he's a WWE. Yeah. Gabe Sapolsky says. Surround yourself with positive people, and once you do that, man, it's a it's a whole different ball game, man. I, you know, and I've gone through some issues, and I see, I hear the shit, and I, you know, and I'm just like, damn. And then I contact or reach out, or somebody reaches out to me, and hey, man, don't worry about it. We got your back. We understand this and this, and and, and it changes the whole deal. Your mental state is Absolutely. is um, yeah. has a lot to do with this stuff. For sure. So if you're being brought down, if you're being knocked down, man, it's hard to continue to, to drive. But you got to get around positive people. You got to, you know, and you got to understand that not everybody's going to be, you know, main event in WrestleMania. You may be the opening match of the BFW, and but if this is what you want to do, that's fine too. Uh, and that part's what try to. I've seen you speak about yeah. it before that that's still an important part of the industry because without the first match, you don't have the last match. Sure. It's a full I'm card. Guys also, put your, pedal, put your foot down on the pedal and leave it there. In other words, just because, and again, Brian Dance and Brian are saying are great examples. Just because you made it, wherever you're trying to make it to, doesn't mean that, all right, I'm here, I can relax, I can chill out. No, man. Yeah. Now you have to maintain. You come, so you, you become complacent. You start to fall behind. Yeah, for sure. Just keep, keep going, man. Because there's always somebody behind you that's gonna try and outdo you. And the minute you release that pedal, they're passing you yeah, up. To come and done. take your spot. Awesome. Uh, understand the wrestling business. So, like what you said earlier, I, when I got in, Chavo Guerrero was like one of the biggest stars, you know. Yeah. And Hector and all those guys. Chavo was my size. I'm five eight, and mm -hmm. and I weighed, you know, two. 05, 200, or whatever. Um, and then, like, the next day, like, once I started wrestling, the next day, out popped Hulk Hogan, Kerry Von Erich, Lex oh. Luger, and all these monsters. And there was no way in the world I was going to go from 5'8 to 6'6. Six, six. Yeah. That doesn't <laughs> happen. I could have gone on steroids. That would have helped. 
I was a steroid guy. So I had to sit down. Where can I fit in? How can I fit in? How can I fit in? You know what? Um, I think it was Joe Blanton told me every every promotion every promotion needs a guy to put talent over. There you go. So yep. Yep. Uh, I was given an opportunity to to uh, come in as a as a job guy from WWE, and I guess they liked what I did because I kept coming back for three years. And each show was like four hundred dollars, four hundred bucks, four hundred bucks, four hundred bucks. I was making more money doing jobs on WWE or WWF at the time than I was making main eventing at the BMW down the street. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. and you know, hey, I'm the I'm the Texas champion, and I got I just got twenty bucks. Yeah. You know, yeah. or I just got a hot dog and a soda. I'm the Texas champion. Sweet. But, <laughs> you know, but but putting over Yokozuna. You know, and yeah, I had people like, ah, I'd rather lay a set on you, ah, but, uh, yeah. But yeah I he didn't sit on you, though. That's what I would have said. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. I got, I got, I paid, I got a new car. Exactly. New car, exactly. Went over Razor Ramon, you know. Um, you know, so I understood I wasn't going to main event WrestleMania. I wasn't going to run a bit. I wasn't going to main event the Great American Bash. Right. But there was still a spot for me in yes. the business. So, and I see a lot of guys today that are like five, you know, five eight or whatever, and 150 pounds, and they're like, "I'm gonna make it." Well, today's a little bit differently because, yeah, you know, Adam Cole isn't that big of a kid, and he's one of the main guys of NXT. It's a little bit different now. There are, you know, there are opportunities for smaller guys, but don't don't sit there and say you're gonna be, you know, the next WWE star because that may not happen. And if that's what you're looking for, and it doesn't happen, then what follows after that? Disappointment, disappointment, disappointment yeah. and anger, and Quit. hate. And, you know, and there's nothing to hate about this business. No. I, I, I love this business. I hate the pe- I hate some of the people are in, that are in the business, but I love the wrestling business. I, and, and, and again, to start this whole thing off, I told you guys, I wasn't even a wrestling fan when I was a kid. <laughs> but today, you can't drag me away from this shit. It's like, I see, I, you know, WrestleMania, or not WrestleMania, but WWE hasn't had a pay-per-view in o- over a year. And I watched part of the, some of the matches last night, and I was like, holy shit, this is great, this is great. Yeah, I stuff too, but it's still great. It's great. It mm-hmm. Wrestling is back in front of a crowd. And you go on social media today, and it's like, oh, that was messed up. Why did they put the belt on this guy? Why did they do this? This made no sense. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, then go, go start your own wrestling exactly. company. Go somewhere else. Start your own promotion. Or don't, or don't watch it. Well, everyone's everyone's so opinionated now. They just won't sit down, shut up, and enjoy the show. Social they, media, they want to yeah. let everyone know what they would have done yeah. better. I'd have booked it that way. Well, when you get your own federation, brother, you book it that way. And so, so I so I tell guys, you love your wife, you love your girlfriend, yes. You love wrestling, yes. Okay, if you love wrestling so much, why are you shitting on you know this match or that wrestling. match or this yeah. pay per view or that pay per view? Instead of if bringing up the guys wrestling, around, if you love your wife so down much, shit. do you shit on your wife when she burns the eggs or she, you know, doesn't cook the the steak right, no. or do you or she doesn't do the laundry? Do you sit there and shit on your wife? You're lazy, you dumb man, you don't do this, you don't do that. No, you deal with it. You say, okay, yeah, she didn't wash the laundry, she didn't, she burned the, you know, she burned dinner. It happens, you know, and you move on. Yep. You love wrestling. It's not every show is not going to be to your liking. Every match is not going to be to your liking. I, I really do not care too much for, uh, I can't think of his name. To me, he's like the stalker, which is a real, it's a weird character to have today. Uh, he was in, in, he was in uh, Impact for a while. Dexter Loomis. He's in, he's in NXT now. It's Dexter uh, Loomis. Who is it? Dexter Loomis. Yes, I'm not too much into that character. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get I'm it. Gonna, I'm like, I, sh- I shouldn't say I don't like it. I just, I'm just not into it. It's weird. But it, he has a job. The yeah. kid has a job. And he's mm-hmm. making good money, and he, they put him in a in a great storyline, yeah. and he's doing well. So it doesn't really matter what I like. It matters That's what like, works. I feel and the same way about like. Uh, like the Sami Zayn playing the schizophrenic, yeah. you know, he, just, he was great. Like he, had, they should have went a different way with his character. He, you know, he's got a lot of skill, and they're making. You know, I don't know where they're gonna go after, you know, they 
his psychotic break, how are they going to bring him back into being a normal character? And you know, on They'll the take roster? him off TV for six months and yeah. bring him back. It's <laughs> just, I, I'm the same way. But what does my opinion mean? You know, you know, it's, it's, we all have things we like and don't like. But you know, Sami Zayn's a worldwide known. Name. Yep. You know, he's a star. You know, and he's doing what he's told to do by his company. And he's, you know, what he yeah, sinks his teeth, in, but he sinks his teeth in everything he's told to do. And that's why I respect yeah, him. Even if I don't like what he's doing, no, he I respect the fact apart. that he sinks his teeth in it. You know, he's professional. That's being professional. No matter what, the, the, the lines are garbage. You know, maybe the, the, the storyline's not great. They show up to work, and they put their 100% into it no matter what. And you know what? That's called being professional. Roman Reigns has given exactly. trash lines for years. Yeah. But he stuck with it. He made it work. And he made it work. You know, he's, the top he's, dog. he's doing a job, and he's getting paid to do this yep. job. I, I, I kind of feel like I'm pretty good at cooking burgers on the grill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if I go to if I go to, to McDonald's and they say, okay, Rudy, uh, you're going to be in charge of taking out the trash, I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, but I know how to cook. Well, you're, 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 <laughs> exactly. you're not too, you're not treating me right. You know, I'm going to do my job told. And, yep. and move on. You know, yep. and, that's, and that's what you know. That's what wrestling is. It's it's at the end of the day, it's a job, man. And you may not like the way they're they're using somebody or you know whatever. Now the big deal I saw was uh, I saw the Usos got the tag belts. I think the Usos because you got yeah, DUI and you should have get it because you got DUI. That's, that's yeah, the big thing so now. Got yeah. with DWI. You know what? If I got if I got a DWI, which there's been many times where I uh, could have happened, yeah, should have plenty of them. <laughs> The last thing I'd want to happen would be for me to lose my job. I'm sure. I'm sure the kid that got popped. I'm. I'm. I'm sure he's not very happy with it. Right. I'm, you know, you see your face on the internet all over the place. You see all the comments. I'm sure his mental state might be taking a hit. So getting fired. I mean, they, they maybe maybe it's the right thing to do. I don't know who who might have make that con- to make that decision. Right. It's not my company. Even if it was my company. If one of my employees got popped for DWI, I would pull him to the side. Hey, man, are you all right? How's your personal shit going? Something Why do guys you? drink? Why yeah, do guys get addicted to drinking? You know, it's not, you don't know what's going on with that kid. And so, um, you know, I don't, you know, they won the belts. Great. You know, let's see what happens now. I don't, I don't care about his personal shit. I don't care about, you know, if he got a DWI, I don't care if he, if it's fifth DWI. He's alive. He's not in jail. Well, he could have killed somebody. He could have, but he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Let's leave it at that. It's not our business. No, he, he Enjoy the show. Little. You know what? And that's, you know, there's probably something going on with him. And, you know, you never know what somebody's going through. So, you know, it's, it's easy to judge me outside. But you never know. He's you know, Like you said, you know, you don't know what he's going through. Obviously, sure. you know, he's a successful athlete, you know, makes good money. Do you think he would want to jeopardize his own life and, his, you know, take himself away from his family? No, I, I don't think so. So, there's something deeper there that's, you know, making him possibly throw and, all that away. And being part of the Noe family, they're just going right. to blow his name up no matter what. Right. So it doesn't really matter, you know. So there's, there's got to be something else there that, you know, the, the, the want to drink has taken over all his logical thought process. So that's really a big yeah, issue. And, so maybe, and, you know, guys, look at that. Guys F up. Guys and girls F up all the time. All the time. Yep. Again, there have been many times... Uh, maybe I shouldn't say this on social media. There have been many times where I've, you know, I've had a few drinks. Where you used to do that in the past, then, right? <laughs> shit, I gotta get home. Right. And, you know, I didn't leave my house thinking, I'm gonna go get shit faced, I'm gonna get drunk, and I'm gonna, have to drive. I'm gonna get a DWI. That's, that's not, that, I don't know of anyone that does that. No, but no. it happens. And, you know, you can make a decision to take a taxi home, or you can, there's a lot of, there's a lot of what ifs, or you could have done this, you could have done that. Well, I didn't. You know, and I'm lucky that I didn't have a wreck, and I'm lucky I didn't hurt nobody. Exactly. You know, uh, you know, guys make bad choices all the time. We're we're all uh, <laughs> we're all human. You know, I mean, it's, it, it happens. So my yeah. concern is, I'm watching a pay per view. This guy, it, you know, these guys won their tag belts. Let's see what's going to happen from here on out. Let's see. Who's gonna, you know, are they gonna put a team together? Are they gonna, you know, who's gonna, who's gonna challenge them for these belts now? I don't care if, if, if one of them had a DWI or one of them no. had a. I want to see some good know, matches. That's, that's his business, not mine. Yeah, I want to see some good matches. 
I yeah. want to see them, you know, as far as progress the storylines and do what they got to do. There's and I'm there. I'm watching it for entertainment purposes. Um, you know, his personal life, his personal life. When they, even back in the day, you never would have heard about this because you know there was no social media. It wouldn't. You didn't. The, the, the promoters never gonna let that hit the newspaper. You would never know this guy's got DWIs, DWIs back in the day. The fans would never know, and the show will go on. And that's the one I'm gonna look at it. You know what? These guys are here for me to watch this, and it's entertaining to me. And that's what they're. You know, their personal life's not my business, and I'm keeping it like that. Unless they're out there murdering people and you know committing crazy crimes and hurting people. You know, then obviously it's a problem. But you know, when it's a personal issue or something like that, you know, I, I don't look at it like that. I look at it. I'm, I'm coming here to watch these guys perform, and they're the best in the world at it, and I enjoy the joy of watching it. And it's, and it's not going to stop me from watching it. That's how I feel. Right. And it was something like that. You know, like people getting murdered. Or whatever. It was something. Let the cops handle it. Exactly. I don't remember. I don't remember of any. I don't know of any social media court. <laughs> in any, in any, State. And it was convicted in court of social media. Of the <laughs> and that's where you go, you know, you have issues and stuff. But I don't know of any, you know, when he got tried in, in a, on a Facebook and Facebook he jail. Of all charges. <laughs> you're right, you know. But you know what? Yeah, but we think we have that kind of power because we're given the ability to speak, right? So we, we're, we're the judge, jury, and executioner on the internet, right? That's how people look at it. But at the end of the day, like you said, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, it, it's never. You, it, there, people are going to forget about it in 15 minutes anyway, and move on with their lives. And have then it'll be the next cause to, to, to you know to, to go and rally for, and that'll be forgotten in 15 more minutes. So that's that's how it goes. It's, it's a cycle, and people are fake outraged for the 15 minute cycles, and they go about their day. <laughs> so you know, if, if someone doesn't you don't like something, just wait 15 minutes. I promise you it's going to go away anyways. And the next problem will roll in. The next problem will be right, right there, on, on, and the next person will be there to save the world on Facebook. That's how it rolls. Yep. Exactly. Get, getting towards the end, if you got any uh, current promotions you're working with, or maybe your girlfriend you said was working with that you want to plug? So, what I would like to, she says I don't give her enough credit, but I do. I, mean, <laughs> I don't tell her, but my, good, my girlfriend um, is working her tail off. Just She works with me. She trains with me two days out of the week, and then she trains with Rodney Mack and Jazz and Thunder Rosa at oh, the yeah. Dogtown Town here in San Antonio. Three days, three days out of the week, uh, I don't mess around with training. They don't mess around with training. So she's she's a uh, you know really working hard. You know, five days, and then she works for uh, for SW from uh, SWE Fury, the promotion up okay. in Dallas. They are doing very well. That's uh, and Teddy Long's promotion. She just right? came back from a. Uh, she just came back from a trip uh, from Florida where she was working with Thunder Championship Wrestling. Uh, great promotion they had, like 400, 500 people at their at their show in uh, Winter Haven. Yeah. Uh, That's right, I'm, I'm, help, I'm helping out a group called uh, uh, Movement Championship Wrestling. The promoter is Rock Moyola. And, uh, and I, I, I completely stumbled on that group. Um, uh, Mike did a show in Ocala for original championship wrestling okay. and these three guys uh, you guys may be uh, familiar with them uh, Vertigo Rivera the chair uh, the other kid is uh, Ramos D. Ramos yeah I've heard and him the other, the other kid is Romeo Cavedo yeah I have him yeah. on my Facebook and, uh, also yep. Romeo is very Romeo is very he's like the stud of the group and uh, the other two guys are very good also don't get me wrong but Romeo is like and he's a Huge kid. I think he had a tryout with WB, but um, through them, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I brought them down here to Texas. I thought they did really well in Ocala, and so I just talked to them and said, "Hey, man, we're going to take three guys to come down." And so they came down and did a show for me, and I'm, I'm looking at bringing them down more often. Um, there were several guys on that show. Persia, Persia Pierce. You know who she is? I do. Yep, I have Persia her on my Facebook. Pierce. Uh, there's another girl named La Brava. Uh, she was outstanding. I mean, there's a lot of kids up in Florida that are, that are very talented. Yeah, there is, there's a huge independent scene right yeah, now. That's what got me back into wrestling. I was I kind of walked away from wrestling for a good 10, 12 years. It was just a cookie-cutter product for me, and I went to an independent show, and it brought back that fire school man. nostalgia. It reminded yeah. me of sitting in a high school gym with my grandmother, seeing my first indie show. I think I seen King Kong Bundy wrestle Jimmy Snuka. <laughs> wow. 
and they were both what a far past their prime. Right, but but, <laughs> but you know. it always brings me back to just these happy memories. That that's what the independent scene does for me, and that's yeah. kind of like you said in this business, know your place. If you you know you got to yeah. take what you can get, and this is where we figure we're too old to jump in the ring and take <laughs> bumps. So commentary and podcast was our kind of route to be able to still be part of this industry. There you go. Yeah, we know our lane. We're, we're going to stay in our lane, but you know what? And if, you, if, you're, if you're back in Florida again, definitely let us know for whatever show you're going to go to. We'll try to make we'll it out there, there and yeah, uh, man. We'd love to see come, your girl wrestle. We'd love to come see that show, man, for sure. Yeah, I, should, I think she does a show for Shine pretty soon uh, over in uh, Fort Ritchie. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, she's knocking it out, man. She's doing, she's doing very well, and I'm very proud of her. She's She's, uh, you know, a lot of girls out there are, uh, I'm not knocking nobody, you know, uh, but I, but I see it because I'm with her and stuff and I see it where they're kind of like, they get, and guys are the same way, you know, where they kind of get, um, personal feelings involved and stuff. It's like, why am I putting her over and why am I doing this? Why? Oh, yeah. And Michael the Trooper, man, she, uh, you know, she just does what she asks her to. No, no headaches, no, she yeah. reminds me a lot of, of, uh. You know, Brian Danielson and Brian Kendrick, man. No headaches, no drama, no... That's that being able to be coached and molded. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and uh, you know, and maybe she's right, I don't give enough credit, but, you know, I sit back and I watch, and, and uh, you know, I go to these shows, and I go as a fan. I don't go as, you know, let me see how bad... A trainer. Yeah. So I go as a fan and watch, and so I was at that show... Um, in Winter Haven Friday, and that was that was Thunder Century Wrestling, and man, from top to bottom, man, the, every match was on the money, man. It was, they were all good. Um, there was a there was a Puerto Rican kid named Tito something who was, I think he's just breaking in, but I mean he's I mean he has a lot of potential, very very good kid. Um, but I mean I go to these shows and I just and watch and just I, I I watch them as a fan. I don't. I don't try and critique anybody, you know, like, oh, that was a dumb drop kick, or you didn't even touch the guy. So I appreciate their efforts and, and how hard these kids are working. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of good talent out there. They just need to find what they're missing. And, and uh, you know, and then some guys walk in, they'll see me, and they're like, hey, Mr. Gonzalez, you know, they'll, they'll catch me on the way to the restaurant, hey, uh, did you see my match? Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> and they'll, they'll ask me to critique them right there, and I'm like, uh, so sometimes what I do is I take like a notepad and pen, I know someone's gonna ask me, so I'll I'll take notes and stuff, or I'll I'll take notes on my phone or whatever. But uh, yeah, and, I, and I'll put that out there too. If I'm at a show somewhere and you see me, man, don't be afraid. To, don't be afraid to ask. You know, hey, can you watch my match? Can you tell me what I did wrong, or you know, how do I contact or whatever? You know, I'm I'm, I'm open to everybody. You know. I'll have guys come up to you and say, hey, man, I saw you wrestle Hulk Hogan. Uh, and I've never wrestled Hulk Hogan. <laughs> but, you know, hey, if that's what they saw, then, yeah, that was me. Sure. Yeah, man, how you been? You know, I saw you when I was 12 years old. And I'm like, you son of a gun, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm feel old. A little nostalgia know. pop, man. Now, if somebody wanted to uh, get a hold of you on, uh, you, for Facebook, Instagram, that's the Texas Wrestling Academy on both yes. of them. And, and Texas Wrestling Entertainment. Okay, um, okay. You know, if they want to, they want to come learn to be a wrestler. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not. I don't hide this fact at all. That if you come to training, you're gonna come to get trained. I mean, simple as that. Uh, I don't, I don't mess around too much. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't sugarcoat nothing. We train just like if you were in the NFL or Major League Baseball or whatever. I mean, that's we train and. Uh, you know, at the dog pound, they do the same thing. I mean, the, the schools that I endorse or that I bring up, you know, Tom Pritchard is no different. I mean, we train, we, we try and produce talent. Um, do you uh, have uh, uh, an email uh, or a phone number for them to reach the school at? Uh, yeah, my number is 210-326-1520. Okay, we're going to put and links for all that in the description. Yeah, we're going to put the links up for all these things, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you up there nice and clear so people can see it. Get some people signed up for school. Watch this man wrestle, watch his wife he wrestled too. And definitely uh, keep in contact with us if you make it back to Florida. We'd be, like We'd love said, to come out and watch the show, man. For, we appreciate it. There's a rumor going out that I may be moving out there. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know what's going on. Awesome. We're, we're really now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Rudy, thank you so much for your time, man. We appreciate you, Rudy. Thank you, We'll be looking out for you, brother. Well, and, uh, go ahead. I really, really, really do appreciate coming on.
on your show. It means a lot to me. Um, and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thank you so hey, much. From, we look from Floridian to future Floridian, brother. You have a good day. We'll see you soon. You too. Take it easy. Later, man. Bye. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap up our episode of Unlacing Kayfabe. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Until next time, let's keep Make Wrestling Great again. It's Make Great, baby. We're out. <laughs>